So hey guys. This is your favorite fiction domain. So in this video, we will see what if Naruto was heir of Deathwing the Evil. But before we start, remember to subscribe and like this video. Now let's start. Separation, being split apart from who you were is agonizingly painful. This is what Naraku Uzumaki agreed full-heartedly on as he was split from his former self, Naruto Uzumaki. Naraku Uzumaki was a high-class hell dragon, one of two ancient species of dragon that existed when the very world itself was created by the gods of ancient times that was considered extinct. But by the use of science and cloning when mixing three types of DNA together created the ultimate monster of destruction. He was a part of a whole, part of the being known as Naruto Uzumaki, not the shinobi who followed a childish dream and ideal without heeding the consequences and suffered from it, but from a clone of the prototype Naruto Uzumaki that, birthed, the original Naruto that was well known in the ninja world. As of now, Naraku was split from his former self, he who served as the negative emotions of Naruto and the destructive nature of his powers. He was chained, imprisoned by these warped creatures called the wicked gods. They hounded him, tortured him, and assaulted his mind as they forced him to absorb every evil ever committed by mankind as it drove him insane. Seeing these evils that humans can commit were horrible, he could not turn away, as he was seeing the very nature of mankind. These wicked gods wanted to turn him into a force called Angra Mainyu, a demon of ultimate evil that would punish every human with death the ultimate killer of humans as their souls will be judged on the promised day these foul gods were planning. And now seeing these evils, Naraku's contempt with humanity grew. They were nothing but curs that needed to suffer for their crimes. No one was innocent, save those who were newly born and the very young. Yes, they could be taught how to live pure, and then maybe he would spare them from utter annihilation like the rest he will slaughter. All in good time. For now, he must accept it like a good little puppet and play their little game for now. He recalled their leader, Deus, was planning to send him to a place called Kalimdor. He would have to use one of the dragon eggs there to be reborn in flesh at last. For Naraku is nothing more than pure dark energy in the shape of a dragon. The thought of gaining flesh and the pleasures of it would be worth doing some of this wicked god's dirty work, till he gained enough power to overthrow those arrogant fools and regain what was lost. Patience is one thing a dragon has, and once things go as planned, revenge will finally be his. But for now, his rebirth as a living, breathing dragon is at hand, and he will accept anything this world will bring to him once he emerges from his egg. Neltharion, earth warder of the land of Kalimdor and his mate. Syntheria watched as their newest clutch of eggs hatched, eager to greet their children into the world as all but one of them hatched. As the dragon whelps screeched to their parents, Neltharion and Syntheria were saddened at the one egg that didn't hatch. It happens every once in a while my dear. Neltharion comforted his mate as he nuzzled the saddened mother as she nudged the egg. With a gentle, loving touch as the egg began to pulsate and glow red. This alerted both Neltharion and Syntheria as the whelps scooted away from the glowing egg as it began to crack, it was hatching. From the shell, a sharp claw tore through, as another one did as the egg fell apart revealing the hatchling within. It looked different from all of its brethren in appearance. Its scales were obsidian black, stood on its hind legs, had a long slender neck, a tail that was thick and strong, elegant black wings that seemed to blend into the shadows, four sharp claws each on the two front forepaws, and the head that had two horned crest of sorts that went back towards the head as a curved, beak-like jaw filled with sharp teeth and blazing red eyes looked at them. What is this? Syntheria asked as Neltharion stretched his claw out and poked the whelp that looked at him as he nuzzled the claw affectionately. Despite his appearance, he is just like the others. Maybe he's a new evolution to our flight? Neltharion guessed as he watched the strange-looking whelp play with the others. Yes, the key to a wondrous future. He must be trained well, a voice inside of the earth warder's head. He turned to find the source, with the strange whelp looking in the same direction with narrowed eyes. Several years later Naraku flew through the skies with great joy, enjoying the wonders of living as an actual dragon for once as he and his fellow drakes practiced aerial maneuvers that afternoon as they felt the breeze come in before departing for home below the earth. 
Naraku enjoyed this family, for it reminded him of his own kind when they ruled the ancient earth of another world eons ago and were ones who were connected to the earth itself like the black dragonflight are. He was the star of his generation, being a symbol of their evolution as they would be closer to the planet than ever before. He was like their dragon aspect Neltharian, as they both understood the planet as if they were one, but Naraku felt it like his father as well, they both felt the weight of the world literally on their shoulders. He studied the metals, collecting them and experimenting on them, much to the confusion of the flight as he began to work with goblins on tempering them and forging numerous crafts of art with them. One time, he and the goblins crafted a statue made of various rocks and minerals to recreate the image of Neltharion with a majestic pose. This had surprised the earth warder himself as Naraku thanked him for being a great father to him and all of his children as Neltharion accepted the gift, humbled by the gratitude that the flight had given him as the statue served as a symbol of what it means to be the earth warder. Several days later Naraku flew north with his father, heading towards the chilling wastelands of Northrend as the snow began to pester him. It kept getting on his wings and it keeps making it hard to fly as it builds up over time. He still lacked the experience to manipulate the heat in his body so he could channel it into his wings to melt the snow off. Right now, he and Neltharion were heading towards the Nexus, to greet a fellow aspect that could be considered Neltharion's brother in all but blood. They had finally reached it, and then, met the dragon aspect of magic himself. Welcome Neltharion, and to you young Naraku. I hope that you'll find this place quite the fun place. Malagos greeted as Neltharion chuckled as Naraku was star-struck at the sight of many magical objects, tomes, and much more. Indeed, though it seems that Naraku is a more curious whelp than I expected. Neltharion mused as the two aspects watched as Naraku began conversing with fellow blue drakes as they all started laughing. It seems he's just like you when it comes to being the snark of the family. Malagos joked as Neltharion laughed. Indeed, being around me has turned him into a mini-me of sorts. Plus he's known for doing good pranks on others. Last time I was his victim, I was stuck looking like an oversized bird eating tree leaves while my tail was used as a drumstick for a gong. He replied as Malagos laughed at that one. He could just see how ridiculous the earth warder looked like if he was there. But one thing bothered him for a while and Malagos just had to as his longtime friend, say Neltharion, why does he look different from the rest of your flight? The spellweaver asked as Neltharion did a dragon version of a shrug. I have no idea, he's unique, and we've speculated he's a new evolution of our flight, as he understands the role of Earth Warder better than anyone else. He sensed where earthquakes were happening from thousands of miles away and where they were heading. It was actually pretty surprising really. He taught whose jaw was agape. Neltharion merely closed the jaw as Malagos shook his head. Impossible, after all these years, an evolution in our kind is unheard of. Malagos exclaimed as Neltharion sighed. Indeed, I'm not sure if this is a blessing, or an ill omen brother. Neltharion replied as he watched his child mixing a few liquids into a vial with other blue dragons. Watching as they were amazed as a rainbow appeared from the smoke that erupted from the fluid. I'd say he's a blessing, and a rare treat to see. I've never seen that trick before. Malagos told his old friend as he was surprised by the mini rainbow and wondered how the young black drake knew how to do that. Well, he's the most surprising knuckle-headed dragon you'll ever meet in a lifetime brother. Neltharion mused, as he wondered when Naraku will never stop pulling such surprises out of nowhere. Oh, and keep this to ourselves. I want to surprise the others with little Naraku when he gets older. I want to see the looks on Alex's face when she sees a dragon like him at my side. Neltharion said as he had the dragon equivalent of a grin. Once he pops out of nowhere with that future intimidating look, I wonder how priceless the look of horror on her face will be. He asked as he and Malagos shared a laugh. It would be a time that would be the last time they would communicate like this, for a dark new beginning was about to unfold. Asterisk 492 years later those voices, Naraku has heard them again, wondering what voices could constantly torment him for some time. He decided to ask his father and see what he can learn from this. Father, he asked, gaining Neltharion's attention as his eyes showed a bit of insomnia in them. Yes, Naraku, what is it that you need son? The earth warder asked as Naraku looked at his father sadly. I'm plagued with recent troubles, ones that I can only trust to share with you. 
He replied as Neltharion became serious. As a father, he had to be there for his children whenever they have problems that plague them. What is it that's troubling you? He asked as Naraku came clean with his problems. I've been hearing voices, telling me to nod. Trust the other flights, of how the life binder would control me, to have me be used as a breeding machine for other flights, of how Malagos would experiment on me, and how you would use me as a tool and throw me away. He replied solemnly as Neltharion's eyes widened at that. He knew what his unique child was talking about, whisperings that plague even his own mind. So he wasn't the only one to feel it, his own son, the one who would lead the black dragon flight to greatness was being haunted by the voices as well. But now he knew, something terrible is happening, but the question is when. Do not believe those voices, we are the protectors of the earth, ones who help nurture it, raise mountains so other races do not wage war, and protect the delicate balance of it. He replied with a dutiful expression on the outside, but inside, he had doubts too, for he wondered why he was given such a burden when he became earth warder. I see, but father, does our great power come with great prices? Naraku asked as Neltharion froze. That question his son asked had answered this long question he had pondered endlessly for thousands of years finally made sense. As one who is one with the earth, he must feel everything from it, the crushing pressure and weight was the price for wielding the great power he had, but did that mean his fellow aspects must suffer from the gifts bestowed upon them by the titans as well? What were these voices that plague him and his son? This was the omen he feared if Naraku's birth had its meaning, while Naraku's mind was strong. Neltharion realized that his own mind is being invaded by the voices much longer. He feared, he feared that these voices will drive him mad and make him commit atrocities that would harm his beloved flight, Syntheria, Naraku, Nefarian, Anixia, and all of his precious children. No, he must do something, something that would protect the legacy of the charge he had been given by his maker. Kazigaroth. Yes son, with great power, always comes with great price. Some so great, that it isn't worth accepting. Neltharion replied solemnly as. Naraku looked at his father with understanding. Therefore, I will name you as leader of a new dragonflight of your own. He announced much to the startling surprise of his son. I entrust you to lead those willing to follow you to the bright future ahead. I fear something will happen to the rest of our flight and I want you to carry on the legacy I have been entrusted with to you. He said as Naraku understood it and chuckled dryly. The old saying of how the old man passes the torch to his son. He said as Neltharion nodded, indeed, the old man passing the hay. I'm not that old. Neltharion barked in realization as Naraku laughed as he was chased by his father for that witty line. Since then, the bond between the father and son had been sealed forever the memories of a loving father etched in. Naraku's heart forever. The next morning Naraku was ready, as he stood out with the members of the new flight he will need. Syntheria followed him, to act as a mentor for him as she trusted Neltharion and the other consorts he had that everything will be alright while she was gone, and that she didn't have to worry that Neltharion getting drunk and caused minor earthquakes with his hiccuping, much to his embarrassment. From this moment forward everyone, we are no longer members of the Black Dragon Flight. Naraku spoke as his followers and mother. Looked at him. We are but the shadows of our former flight. Our actions will be unknown to those who do not understand the sacrifices we'll make. Of how we'll protect this land if the black dragon flight were to ever fall. We who walk in the darkness, our wings seeking to reach for the light from beyond those who have fallen from grace. As we carry on the legacy as Neltharion's proud flight. We are the dark wing flight. Naraku roared as he flexed his. Wings that radiated a superb amount of power as the newly dubbed flight roared with him. Neltharion watched on, smiling as Naraku and his new flight took to the skies as Syntheria gave him one last look as she followed Naraku towards their next destination, finding a new home and to guide themselves into finding a place in the world as a new flight that will protect the legacy of the Earth Warder if anything were to happen. Be safe everyone, Neltharion thought sadly, for the whisperings grow even stronger. Naraku and his darkwing flight flew into the night sky, feeling the eyes of beings down below. They were probably the night elves he heard about. From what he's learned about these beings, they were probably descendants of dark trolls that evolved from the magic from the well of eternity as they lived near it for all of their lives. 
So far, he's heard of some staying to the path of arcane magic while others are being connected to the natural magic of nature itself. He never understood the nature of these beings, nor their desires. But for now, they were not his concern, for he must find a perfect mountain to serve as a new home for his flight. Maybe Mount Hyjal will be the perfect place to find a place to reside in. He just hoped the residents there won't mind. The elves watched these black dragons fly to the mountain, curiosity filling them as the scouting team began to pursue them, wondering what these creatures were planning near their homes. Riding their mounts in silent pursuit, they reached the landing point as they watched the supposed leader, one who looked different from the others of its kind, especially since it stood upwards, as it waved its hands and the earth moved to his command. The dirt shifting as stones were made as a new cavern was created, they wondered. Was this dragon and its kind closer to the land like their druids were? They had to report this to Stormrage. He will know what to do if he could contact his supposed teacher Cenarius. Naraku was no fool. He sensed the mortal elves spying on him created a new cave for his flight. Now he'll have no choice but to block the entrance now that it is discovered. He heard the earth echo their footsteps as they left swiftly and quietly away from the area. He didn't know what they want. They probably wanted to see what his flight were doing. For now, they will have to build other lairs in this mountain and make sure to keep them secret. Let's go Naraku. We'll take care of our new home tomorrow morning. Syntheria told her son as Naraku nodded his head and walked in last after the other members of his flight went inside, sealing the entrance with stone as he and his flight looked at the design of the cavern. It was huge and spacious, with many stalagmites and columns of limestone supporting the ceilings of the cavern as a natural spring pool filled the very center of the cavern as the young whelps that joined Naraku's flight ran there and began gulping the water greedily, thirsty from the long trip to their new home. Rest up, because we'll be expanding and creating new barrows in this area in case we're being hunted by unwanted guests. Naraku ordered as the dragons agreed with him as they all found a spot for them to sleep in as they huddled together and began to embrace their dreams. Naraku being last as he became one with the earth to see if there was anything going on around the area by sensing the vibrations of the earth. Sensing nothing, he cut the connection and curled up next to his mother and began his dream. Isera the green dragon aspect heard her student, Cenarius call. Hearing of a new group of black dragons led by one different in appearance than the others had perked her curiosity. She delved deeper into the emerald dream as she proceeded to the location of this lair those black dragons and find the one she sought. She recognized Syntheria, the prime consort of her brother figure. Neltharion there and the supposed leader of this group. She connected to the dreams of this strange dragon and was thrown into a nightmare. She saw it, his pain and anguish. How he was tormented by evils by beings that surpassed the titans in power as they infused him with them. For some reason, these evils, the curses, and the powerful malice is being locked up by a powerful force. She realized this dragon had hope of salvation from this burden. But she realized something. This dragon was not naturally native to Azeroth. No, his appearance seemed far more ancient than even the proto-dragons she and the other aspects originated from. What was he? Even stranger. He was not a full dragon, more like a mixture of something else, an unknown creature. Plus this hollow aura emitted from him, it was once a powerful being that was split into three pieces. It sought to be whole one again, it yearned to be whole once again, it dreams of reuniting with its lost halves and be one glorious being once again. Leave, no, the instincts were telling her to leave, but her heart, the heart of a mother, refused to allow such a creature one with the heart of a young infant crying all alone, to suffer. She must find a way to undo these burdens this dragon has to endure. Maybe Malagos would be able to create something with his arcane knowledge to rid of all these evils carved onto the being's soul. You will do no such thing. Before the dreamer could realize it, she was hit head on with a powerful tackle as she quickly recovered and threw back the being that dared to attack her. She saw it, a dragon in the shape of the one she entered. It was the form of a black void in dragon shape as its piercing red eyes glared at her with hostile intent. It did not look friendly at the moment. And when Isera looked at it, she saw the ugliness of things she could not describe. It was as if she was seeing the ultimate nightmare incarnate. She was hesitant but now she knew, she was in contact with the leader of this group of black dragons. What are you? She asked as the void dragon looked at her with narrow eyes. Your worst nightmare, now leave and forget all. 
that you've seen, or else, the creature threatened as Isera knew that this young dragon definitely had the audacity to tell her what to do. She was a dragon aspect, a powerful one at that, and she would not move at the will of others. Or else what? She asked, her eyes still closed as the black void dragon looked like it was smirking. The creature charged with a roar that shook the dream, as the sky blackened and he blended in with the darkness as he too, closed his glowing red eyes. Isera knew that he now considered her a threat, she listened to the sound of the creature's wing beats and dodged. The monster snarled in anger as it opened its eyes, forgetting to hit them as it charged at her with a sickening madness to kill. She had to hold back with her powers, no matter what. This evil that tainted its soul pitch black had turned it into a monster designed only to kill, but kill what? From the way it fought as she avoided the shadowy dragon swipes, it was killing only small beings, something mortal like the elves. Isera blasted the void's wings with her breath aligned with the power of nature as it struck true to its aim as the being fell. What sort of cheap trick did you do to me you buy? It demanded as it crashed into the ground. Lying still as it groaned in pain. Isera sighed sadly. The poor child was consumed by an evil that it did not want to bear. She landed a good distance away and proceeded to walk towards the creature, as it struggled and stood on its hind legs as the wings faded away. Then, its form changed. It was slender, built for speed and power, and it had nine tails. What Isera was. Looking at, was a black nine-tailed fox as it snarled at her. If she could blink, then she would have done so as the black fox appeared above her and slammed its nine tails onto her back, slamming her to the ground as the fox landed on her. This originally was a simple search for the group of black dragons, now it was turned into a battle of life and death, funny how reality works no. Isera knew this creature was in a blind rage, and if he awoke in his current state now, something terrible will happen. She will have to subdue the creature here and now, while she wasn't the one for fighting, but here in the world of dreams, where she can't banish him from it or else he'll awaken and go on a rampage, and she did not know what she was dealing with now. It was more like a demon in dragon form that shape shifts at will. She refused to open her eyes, to use her true power on a being like this is no exception here. This child was still in pain, and she must find a way to soothe the rage in his heart, but now must fight back or risk suffering for her compassions. With that, Isera dodged the incoming fox as she swiped her tail, tripping the fox as she opened her maw and bit into his arm, causing the fox to howl in pain. Enraged, the fox slashed at her torso, causing her to bleed as she refused to let go as she gathered all of her physical strength she could must and go beyond the limits and threw the black fox over as it slammed onto its back. Isera used her green breath, trying to put her enemy in a deeper sleep. But the fox saw her intentions and recovered, narrowly avoiding her attack as the fox transformed back into the dragon she was familiar with, while still retaining the nine tails of the fox. And it was serious this time as it regrew its wings and started to walk around her on its hind legs cautiously, like a predator facing a prey that still resists. I will end this, it spoke as it split into nine copies, much to the Isera's shock as they all lunged at her from different directions, cutting off all possible routes to escape. Isera faced it head on, unleashing her breath and slashing at the copies with her claws and smacking them with her mighty tail. But this time, the numbers have overwhelmed her. Even a single dragon aspect can be overwhelmed by enemies they have not encountered before, never gauging their enemy's skills or abilities. Walking in blind is short of suicide. Dragon aspects are the mightiest of their colored flight. They will power, but at the same time, great weaknesses. Neltharian, Earth Warder was prone victim to evil whispers in the earth, one that plagued Naraku and the other black dragonflight. The life binder was to feel the pain of losing her precious children too. Death's grip when they perish in battle, Isera's is her own realm. For dreams of the being she enters when they sleep become omnipotent gods as they control what happens in their dreams. The black void dragon was no exception as his dream was made real, defeating a powerful enemy with all of his might. The minute Isera entered this dragon's dream, she had already lost when he became serious. Now, she is now the victim of this creature's superiority as she cannot escape from the dream she is in. She must wait till he awakes if she is to ever get free. They smashed into her, clawed at her, breathed flames of darkness, bit into her body, 
and then pinned her to the ground as all the copies merged into one as the dragon stood over her and bit her in a certain part of the neck, causing Isera's eyes to nearly open themselves in shock. This dragon had done something of ancient dragon culture, one forgotten in ancient times. Ones used by the proto-dragons when selecting a mate for life. A male proto-dragon would fight his chosen mate and if proven to be the victor, would bite his mate on the collarbone of the neck. This dragon had proven his dominance and had marked her, sealing the deal permanently, she now belonged to him. Naraku watched as the green wyrm became limp, submitted to him after he bit her in the collarbone. He wondered what that had done exactly, for her to be like this all of the sudden. You've marked me, she said in a quiet tone, he was confused, what had he done? Then he realized he must have done something, something he did not know and now the chaos is about to begin. What did I do exactly? He asked, his rage dissipated as the green dragon, with her eyes still closed, looked at him from behind her eyelids. You've marked me as a mate for life, she replied. Oh shit, not something I'd expect on the first day as the new leader of a newly born flight, Naraku thought, wondering what chaos will be unleashed. At least it was just a green dragon and not the legendary Isera the dreamer now. Oh how irony comes back and toys with him. Because of this, you are now one who also leads the green dragon flight. I am Isera the dreamer, and now, you're mate for life. Isera spoke as she stood and looked at the stunned look on. Naraku's face. Shit, I've really caused some serious problems. I just hope that this doesn't cause any problems in the future. Naraku thought. Nazdormu, dragon aspect of time and leader of the bronze. Dragonflight frowned at the sudden distortions in the flow of time. History has been rewritten, and he must find the source of the problem. Time to find the SS source of this problem before it's too late. The great aspect spoke, as he sent his fellow agents to find out what is going on. Ever since you were a mere whelp, you've always caused a riot of sorts. Syntheria said with a calm and quiet voice. But just for once, can't you at least try not to get involved with situations like the one you are in now? She asked as Naraku was sitting upright with his head down in embarrassment as a semi-transparent greed dragon that was a third bigger than him was by his side. Sorry mother, but I am going to be honest and say I did not expect anything like this to happen to me. I know I can cause trouble on a whim, but not unintentionally like this, he told her as he looked at the green dragon that looked at Syntheria. So, if I'm to make this straight, Naraku here is the son of. Neltherian's clutch with you and was leading a new flight? She asked as Syntheria nodded. Indeed, though I didn't expect you. Isera, to come and give us all a visit while we were dreaming. And here we are now, with the rest of our new flight trying to understand the situation Naraku is in. She said dryly as indeed, the rest of the Darkwing flight were surprised with the green dragon aspect's sudden appearance besides their great leader when they all awoke. Syntheria nearly had a heart attack from the sight as well. Plus, Hearing that the two of you somehow became mates for life by Naraku from accidentally biting you at the collarbone without knowing what it meant is another great shock. She added in as Naraku slumped his head down comically as he heard some members of his own flight snicker at his fortune as he turned with the glare at the ones who snickered, causing them it instantly shut up as he made his witty reply. Father did say that he wished that every dragon aspect were related to each other so they could be family in some way. Now Isera is officially his sister-in-law alongside Alexstrasza. This should be a surprise for both of them. He retorted as Syntheria and Isera chuckled. Naraku had indeed inherited Neltherian's well-known snark to a degree. Though what's been bothering me is your appearance. The green aspect said, looking at Naraku's body as she noted the details even more carefully. Your appearance is much different from the other black dragons of Neltherian's flight, or the ones in this flight as well. She told him as Naraku felt uncomfortable at that. Luckily, Syntheria made her reply. Naraku is considered a new evolution in our flight. He is much closer to feeling the very earth itself as the earth warder himself, and is capable of doing things similar to his father. Though he is still inexperienced with a few things, he is almost like a Neltherian version too. One with the earth has the same great wisdom like his father, and they are both the snark of the family. She told Isera who nodded. I can actually see the resemblance in them. She said as Naraku chuckled nervously at that. So question, how is your consort going to take this? Naraku asked as Isera looked at him. 
If her eyes weren't closed, he was sure she would have blinked at the question owlishly. That I do not know. I have yet to tell him the news. She replied as Naraku rolled his eyes. He had a feeling that things weren't going to go well, that's for sure. Several hours later, I called it, I fucking called it. Naraku thought with a wry smile on his draconic face as he was facing with one green WYRM who was the only known consort of Isera the Dreamer, Oranicus, was unhappy with the new situation at hand. Hell, Naraku was unhappy with his situation as well, but it didn't have to go to a duel of all things. Oranicus had decided to test Naraku to see if he was worthy to being a mate for Isera, since that privilege was a more powerful relationship between two dragons than being a consort, from Naraku's point of view, it was more out of jealousy and pride if the look in Oranicus' eyes were to say anything to that. Right now, they were in a glade with his darkwing flight and members of the green. Dragonflight flying above, watching the battle that was about to give way. Also, it seems that some night elves have grown curious of this debate as they watched from the shadow of the trees. The two dragons were walking on the marshlands as Naraku felt one with the earth as the marsh didn't reduce his movements compared to Aranicus was. He walked on his hind legs as he flexed his claws and snarled with intimidation. Aranicus who could only stay on all fours snarled as well while flapping his wings. They were only to subdue their opponent, fatal injuries were not allowed. Naraku started first, clenching his left claw in a fist. He did an uppercut to the air as the earth below Oranicus slammed his underbelly with brute force as it rose. The dark wing flight roared with pride as Isera watched with disappointment, not from Naraku's stunt, but the fight in general. She, like her sister Alex Straza, disproves of fighting. Oranicus recovered from the blow as he unleashed his breath attack at Naraku. The high-class held dragon smirked as a wall of stone rose in front of him and took the blow as it slowly fell apart. The wind is my brother, and the heavens aid me in flight. He chants began to twist and turn violently as the consort of Isera. Looked bewildered by nature's sudden turn against one who is with nature. The night elves themselves were baffled, for one was a druid and they sensed the powers of nature itself aid the black one more than the green one. Even this gained Isera's attention as she felt the Emerald Dream's powers aiding Naraku. He took flight, charging at Oranicus with a bloodthirsty roar as the green WYRM charged at him. The two collided as they were in a deadlock. Due to Naraku's flexibility and speed from his body structure, he was able to avoid most of the swipes and bites from his opponent as his beak-like jaw opened up as it gathered an orb of red fire. Oranicus instantly noticed this and prepared to fire his own breath weapon against Naraku's as they both fired their ultimate attacks at blank range, causing an explosion to erupt as a shockwave followed suit. Naraku and his opponent crashed into the marsh bellow, several yards away from each other as Naraku stood and roared. Demanding his opponent to rise and fight, Oranicus replied with his own roar as he stood as they charged at each other. The claw marks on their beautiful scales dripping blood as the two fought. Naraku had the advantage though, his kind, the Hell Dragons, was born with the ability to fight both on all four legs, and standing up on their hind legs. In this case, standing up on his hind legs aided him against the Emerald Consort as his forearms were wrapped around Aranicus' neck as he struggled to shake the leader of the Darkwing flight off. Naraku refused to back off, and he planned on ending this without any more blood that fell into the marsh they were standing in. It was a wrestling move he learned while he was still whole and part of Naruto Uzumaki. It was a choking hold that makes the opponent lose conscious due to the lack of oxygen. A simple and clean defeat. As his grip tightened as Aranicus bit into Naraku's leg, he refused to roar out in pain as he increased the force of his choke even more. Aranicus' teeth sank deeper into his leg. The bone-crushing force only made Naraku increase the might of his hold as he squeezed tighter around his opponent's neck. The two dragonflights, the elves, and Isera herself held their breath in anticipation, to see what would happen next. Oranicus' jaw loosened, as he fell from Naraku's grip as he lost conscious. Naraku growled in the aching pain in his leg as he let. Loose a mighty roar that proved his dominance, and right to be mate to the green dragon aspect. His flight roared with him as Naraku. Looked down at the unconscious Oranicus, saluted the consort with respect. That was one worthy battle, he told the green WYRM, may this battle be remembered for all time, he said as Isera and 
Syntheria descended towards him. Syntheria with a proud expression and Isera with an intrigued expression, that's my son, my precious son. Syntheria cooed as Naraku smiled at his mother. He was happy being born to a dragon mother like her in this new life. You truly are an interesting dragon Naraku, Isera commented as she looked at the bite marks on his leg. You have proven worthy to be my mate for life, she told him as Naraku nodded and nuzzled her affectionately. I promise I will do my best for the both of us, he told her, and deep inside Isera's heart, she felt that this dragon will indeed do his best. But now we must treat the wound, before it gets infected she said as Naraku looked down at the leg. With that, he turned towards the trees and the elves watching them from afar froze. Using one claw, he gave a, come here, gesture as they stiffened. Narrowing his eyes at how they refused to move, he made the gesture one more time, and this time, the earth that the elves were standing on moved towards the three dragons, much to Synthria's and Isera's surprise. I see you elves were enjoying the scenery, care to tell me where I can find a place of healing? He asked with a toothy smile. One night elf, a female at that, looked surprised at the black dragon, bye. Elune's grace, I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw you and the green one fought. Yet you did not kill him, had Elune herself prevented the dragon's death? She asked. Naraku chuckled, Elune the moon goddess and progenitor of the night elves, a pacifist at heart and a mother. She has the ability to quell the rage of other creatures so that they may cease to fight each other, even those who were about to kill. In a sense, but even we dragons do not needlessly kill unless required to. Don't believe everything you hear about us dragons until you've confirmed it with us, he told her as she nodded. I see, and then at least, I may be able to heal the wound with Elune's light, she said as Naraku raised a non-existing brow. Go ahead, he told the female night elf who nodded. He listened, as the other elves looked tense with the presence of Syntheria and Isera right by him as the female night elf had begun chanting a prayer to the moon goddess. He watched with amazement, as he felt the gentle, warm light that comforted him like a mother's love as the light made the bite marks heal and then fade away. As the female night elf stood back, Naraku inspected the work and was clearly impressed. Thank you night elf, Naraku told her as his eye looked at hers, for your kindness, I bestow you this gift. He said as the earth opened as molten rock rose as he clutched it in his massive claws. He molded it in various ways as everyone wondered what it was as he revealed a metal made of platinum with an image of Naraku with rubies as eyes as he handed it to the elf. A symbol of gratitude, whenever you're in need of assistance, this metal will call me in my flight for anything you need. Whether it be for wisdom, battles, or for a social bond, we shall come. He told her as the female night elf took it. Thank you great one, may I ask your name? She asked as her two friends looked at the craftsmanship of the metal with surprise. Naraku Uzumaki, leader of the Dark Winged Dragonflight, he told her as she nodded, and I am Tarande Whisperwind, priestess of the moon in training. The night elf introduced herself, and these two are? He asked, looking at the two male companions as they were actually twins. A Malfurion Stormrage, sir. A druid in training, and this here is my brother, the male elf said as the other one looked at him without fear. Illidan Stormrage, he finished for his brother Malfurion. Naraku looked at the two, sniffing them as he grinned. You two have potential, ones that even I can tell. Pursue the paths you take, and take caution with what you do with your actions. He told them as he looked at Illidan, because doing things without thinking of the consequences could be your undoing. He said as he took flight, with Syntheria and Isera following him as a few members of the Green Dragonflight picked up the unconscious body of Aranicus as they flew off. Darkwing Barrows, to Naraku, for making us the proudest dragons to ever follow his path. A black drake shouted as other members of the flight cheered as they began their feast. Naraku smiled as his flight enjoyed them and made merry. Even some members of the Isera's flight joined in as said aspect herself was by his side as they enjoyed the liveliness. Of the feast, Aranicus was there as well, as he and Naraku decided to get along as they enjoyed a good old feast fit for dragons as they all laughed, joked, and other humorous things as Isera watched with a smile. The feast lasted for hours on end as most of the dragons there passed out from full bellies as Aranicus left, trusting Naraku to take care of Isera as he went to patrol the Emerald Dream.
As Naraku curled in comfort in his own personal part of the cave, Isera laid beside him. He nuzzled her affectionately as she returned it. He would do his best to be by his new mate's side, the new family he had, was about to grow bigger in the future. Void of creation The void of creation, a world of nothingness, was where powerful creatures like the titans and the gods go to create new worlds and new beings particular god of an ancient civilization, Ea, sensed something he thought was impossible. An ancient creature thought to be long extinct had returned to the world of the living, but he also sensed the works of the wicked gods tainting the magnificent being's form as he frowned. He must find this creature, and see if this being was the one who would be worthy of creating a sort of rupture like he had done during the days of creation. He began his travels through the flow of time and space. Intent on finding the creature, and see if it was worthy to prove itself. Fit as a ruler of an entire world. It had been many years since the day Isera became his mate for. Life. The more he spent time with her, the more he grew to love her, and to her, she too grew to love him. Isera kept the incident of being his mate from every other aspect, wanting to surprise them all with the news as they looked at the new clutch of eggs. They made it a few times, and their surprise grew as the eggs she laid, while usually emerald in color, were now jade-colored as the dragon whelps inside slept peacefully in the eggs. Isera nudged them affectionately as Syntheria and Naraku lead the Darkwing flight into increasing the various tunnels down below the earth, creating new caves for other species to thrive in. The new inhabitants made themselves home there as Naraku took to the surface. He had visited Tarande and her friends once in a while, for his own time or whenever Tarande called for him. He had given her and her friends the wisdom he had an advice to avoid trouble, he nearly laughed as he recalled how Illidan had doubts of the Emerald Dream until Naraku, who had learned how to enter the dream just recently, pulled him in there. Needless to say, the priceless look on the young night elf's face was etched into his brain forever. Though Illidan was a night elf, he was more interested in the arcane arts that the highborn use, channeling the magic of the Well of Eternity to perform their tricks. He had warned Illidan to take caution when using magic, because magic can both harm and help the one who uses it. And he was serious when he told the well-known reckless elf who took this lesson to heart, more like Naraku threatening to eat him and then throw him back up right in front of everyone for public humiliation. Malfurion, he was taking lessons from the demigod Cenarius that alone is interesting in Naraku's case as he heard of how powerful the demigod was in the son-mother relationship he had with Isera. He respected Cenarius as he did his best to protect the forests of the land from defilement as he was connected to the Emerald Dream, like Isera is. But as of late, Naraku was feeling something in the air. Something was going on with the highborn elves and the Well of Eternity. It didn't bother him at first, but then, the whisperings returned. He heard them once in a while, scheming, planning, and then mentioned his father which made him begin to worry about the black dragon flight. It seems that it was time to give his father a long-awaited visit. Neltharian's lair Neltharian, Earth Warder and the dragon aspect of the earth itself spilt his blood as the goblins took it. He was nearing it, perfecting his ultimate creation that would lead him to being the supreme ruler of the world. That was then, he felt the whispers leave his mind as an all too familiar presence landed at the entryway of his lair. He wasn't the only one who sensed it, the other members of his flight did too as they felt their minds clear, soothed by the beating sound of the earth in its beautiful rhythm as the entity entered the lair. Father, it's me. Naraku. You there? The voice rang out as Neltharian grinned. His precious legacy had returned, and from the looks of it, a visit. Naraku was a good whelp always listening and following his father's orders as he led his darkwing flight to another area. In here son, he called from below as he heard the heavy footsteps of his son walking in. Neltharion looked at his son, rivaling him in size as he had finally become a WYRM himself after all those years. He sensed the power his son radiated as he came towards him and gave him a long hug. It's been a long time father, I'm sorry I haven't been able to see you, Nefarian, or Enixia in a while. Naraku said as he broke the hug as Neltharian grinned at him. Nonsense, you can come and visit us anytime you want. Now come here, I'm working on a new creation of mine. I call it, the Dragon Soul, he said as. Naraku's curiosity got to him. He watched the goblins work away with the metals of the earth as he saw the object with his own eyes. 
a simple harmless golden disc with a chain, but deep down, Naraku knew never judge a book by its cover. It might kill you if you're reckless. Interesting, what is it supposed to do exactly? Naraku asked with curiosity as Naltharian. Laughed. This dragon soul will be considered the most powerful. Beam of doom, as Malagos puts it, and will make his scales green with envy at such a masterpiece. He replied as Naraku pictured the aspect of magic having green scales like Isera and her flight before breaking down and started to laugh at the thought. Oh man, I've got to have the blueprints of this thing. Then when I do, I'll make it ten times better that'll make you green with envy. Naraku joked at the two shared a laugh that shook the entire cavern, much to the goblin's dismay. But apparently, while Naltharian didn't mind the idea at all, but the goblins knew Naraku was quite the mechanic when he wanted to be, and he might create an artifact that would surpass the dragon soul if he had the right resources. They spend hours talking, catching up on lost times as Naraku explained how his flight has been as he mentioned how Syntheria had been. Neltharion was pleased with the results and explained what the purpose of the dragon soul was. During the time of great crisis, he and other dragonflights would give a portion of their power unto the soul and use it to destroy armies or monstrosities that threatened the world. Naraku was impressed by his father's idea. This weapon was made like no other had. Maybe even, the most powerful weapon ever forged. Soon, our freedom will come. Yes, yes, let the little whelps do our dirty work. The great chaos about to be unfolded is, invigorating. Naraku mentally frowned at the whispers in his mind, no doubt an ancient evil of some sort that has affected the beings below, with him and his father the prime victims. But when Naraku looked into his father's eyes, there was very little of what reminded him of the great earth warder left. Madness that was what he was seeing in his father's eyes. It sickened and saddened him of how the mighty have fallen. As he bid his father farewell, he flew over the well of eternity and blinked, he saw something in the area that shouldn't be possible, even in all things in reality he wished that he wasn't seeing right now. Demons were raiding the area. It was a partial amount of them, more like scouts, but now he knew from the depths of his heart, that something big is going on. He had to hurry home and warn his flight and Isera of the impeding danger. If this threat is not handled immediately, then this world might be destroyed. Neltharion looked at his precious dragon soul, holding it eagerly in his claws gently as he sensed the strange demons out there. They would make excellent test subjects for his dragon soul, and that would prove to be very helpful to see if it would work. If it does, then his dream for the perfect world he has envisioned will come into fruition. He will be the new world's god, with Naraku as his heir to a new evolved flight of black dragons, and Alexstrasza and Isera as his slaves for mating. He relished in the power of the dragon soul, and with it, he shall become the mighty ruler of the world. Nazdormu hissed with annoyance as his agents found the anomaly, a new one that was different in many ways possible. This, Naraku is a wild card on levels even the great aspect of time had begun to fear. With this dragon, he could see endless scenarios play out as heading to this story that could work in his favor, for saving Neltharion from the corruption he is enslaved by and the salvation of other mortal beings caught in the conflict. This soul dragon is the key, but he is a redeemer and destroyer, a pawn and messiah, a time-spanned soul that must embrace this new destiny. Naraku had told his flight of what he saw and they were on edge. Isera was away on her aspect duties when he returned so he must wait on her to see if there is something that they can do to have the aspects come and stop this possible demonic invasion before it becomes a nightmare to all living beings. Sorry I am late my beloved. Isera spoke as she appeared in semi-transparent form as Naraku smiled at his mate. No problem Isera, so listen, I was flying over the well of eternity and Alex Straza is calling a meeting, all of the other aspects are gathering due to this Krizu's behest. It includes the demons recently spotted near the well of eternity, she said as Naraku blinked. Damn, that was fast. Is this Crassus guy someone who knew the future? He thought. The irony was going to get him once he learns the truth of Crassus. We are to meet at the Chamber of the Aspects. Are you ready my beloved? Isera asked as Naraku grinned at the thought of the many jaws that would drop with the surprises he will bring. Ah. Times like these he feels like Naruto Uzumaki again. Ready my love, on my way. He roared as he took flight off to the skies. Crassus, lover of the Queen of Life Alexstrasza, 
teacher of the mage Ronin, and also the member of the Kirin Tor of Dalaran in the far future, was trying his best not to react to the sight of the dragon. Aspects as they came into the chamber of the aspects one by one. Besides seeing his beloved queen, there was Isera the dreamer, whose slim form that was half seen by a haze of sorts as her eyes were still closed. He was in despair as he did not hear of anything about Nazdormu coming to this summons, but suddenly, something wild and magical happened. Brilliant flashes of red bolts and electrical storms descended to the ground swiftly as it exploded into awe-inspiring colors as it began spreading out and taking form. Out of it, a massive blistering dragon that had seemed to be made part crystal and ice appeared from the fading storm. With a merry expression on his face, it looked like he enjoyed the spectacle more than anyone else. Welcome, Malagos, Alex Straza greeted in a polite manner as the aspect of magic looked at her. Such a pleasure to see you, Queen of Life. He said with a hearty laugh as she looked at Isera. And you too, my fair dream. He said as Isera nodded silently who also had a hint of humor in her expression. So, how fares your realm? Alex Straza asked her longtime fellow aspect who beamed happily. As wondrous as I would wish it, filled with brightness, filled with colors, and filled with young. He exclaimed as Isera smiled at that. Perhaps the creator should have made you father of life instead of guardian of magic Malagos. She commented as Malagos looked at her with a smile. An interesting thought. Perhaps a matter to discuss some other day. He laughed as Crassus felt guilt swept up deep inside of him. Crassus was aware of the fate of Malagos in his time, betrayed by the one he called brother, madness descending upon him, and all lonely in the frozen north. How could he say it to the legendary dragon? He was lucky his queen was able to keep himself from being. Interrogated by Malagos as Isera mentioned specifically that two more dragons were coming, as if on cue, one of these dragons entered the chamber, encircling the place twice before landing. It was a black leviathan, rivaling all of the aspects in size, with the definition of noble in depiction as any other dragon out there. Narrow veins of actual gold and silver streaking from the front to the back, accenting his spine and sides as his black scales hinted with precious gems naturally embedded in his hide as he radiated a primal power around him. You have called and I have come. It is always good to see my friend Alex Straza. The dragon spoke as the dragon queen smiled. And I welcome your presence, dear Neltharion, she replied. The minute the name of the black dragon was spoken, Crassus, atop of his past self Coriolstraz, fought to keep himself from shaking. If he fought to keep himself from reaction to Malagos, he struggled to keep himself from shaking from horror at the future enemy of all the dragon flights. This dragon, the one who, if he was one of, Alex Trasier's flight, would have selected him as one of her mates, the one dragon he wanted to emulate when he first met the great being in his younger years, which stopped after Neltharion's future madness, the betrayer, the black scourge of his time, Deathwing. We must wait for one more, and he'll be here shortly. Isera spoke up, with a smile on her reptilic face, gaining the attention of the other aspects. Who is it? Nazdormu himself. The portal leading to the chamber of aspects shook from the incoming being, the power the creature radiated as it landed on its back legs as its wings were outstretched as Crassus could not recall anything about this dragon. Everyone, meet the leader of the Darkwing Dragonflight, and my mate for life, Naraku, Isera. Introduced as every aspect, one time traveler, and one consort of the life binder looked completely shocked at the news as Naraku unleashed a mighty roar as he stood tall and proud in front of all in sight. Crassus knew something was wrong from what he had just heard right now. He recalled nothing of this dragon at all. And this Naraku being the leader of a new dragon flight and the mate of Isera was something he did not expect. Even the other dragon aspects and Coriolstraz, his past self, was caught off guard by the unexpected news from said green dragon aspect. Was history already altered? Was something much worse ready to be unfolded? This dragon was different in appearance than any other. That was when Naraku noticed two other dragons and had a toothy smile. Reading's father, and Uncle Malagos, I still see that you're the jubilee of the aspects as usual, he said as Malagos laughed. Indeed I am. But to hear that you're the mate to Isera and a leader of a new flight was quite the unexpected, he exclaimed as he and Naraku got into a hug of sorts. Neltharion, however, looked like he 
was sucker punched, which Crassus took note of as he suddenly realized what Naraku called him. F father, Crassus exclaimed in utter shock as this got Naraku's attention as he got close to Coriol's Traz and looked at the small being on top of the consort. Indeed, I am the son of Neltharion and Syntharia, and may I ask you both for your names? He asked politely as Coriol's Traz spoke first. I am Coriol's Traz, consort of my queen, Alex Straza, and first in love. He greeted as Naraku laughed at that. Crassus, it's just Crassus. Crassus replied as Naraku nodded, keeping that name in mind as he looked at the consort of Alex Straza. Is that so? Then remember, always care for her and be by her side even in the darkest of times, your love for her will comfort her. Whenever she feels down, he told the red dragon who nodded. I see he gives great advice just like you Neltharion, Alex Straza. Commented as Neltharion nodded in agreement as she looked at her younger sister for answers. Can you explain to me what happened for you to call him your mate? She asked as the aspect of dreams. Just smiled. Then after a brief explanation, Neltharion had an extreme exasperated expression on his face after hearing the story, and of the new clutch of eggs between the two different flights. Naraku, why must you always make difficult situations whenever I turn my back from you? He asked as the leader of the Dark Wing flight laughed it off. Well, it just comes to me naturally father, now all we have to do is give Nazdormu some time to show up, he said. Now this caused Malagos to laugh at that comment, give the Timeless one more time, how droll, I will not let Dower Nazdormu leave without pressing him on that jest, yes I'm time and time again with it, will you not? Neltharion returned with a smile as Malagos and Naraku laughed at that line as the two aspects scuffled to one side in a deep conversation already. Even though they are not brothers by blood, they are like ones in nature. Naraku commented as he returned to Isera's side as his mate's closed eyes followed the two. They are indeed my dear. So sister, how did you? Like the surprise? Isera asked as Alex Straza looked at Naraku with keen eyes. Very surprised sister, and I did not expect a child of. Neltharion to be your mate for life Isera. The queen of life commented as she looked at the strange looking black dragon. Believe me sis, I will make sure Isera is taken care of with all the love in my heart. He said, as the red aspect took a brief blink at. What Naraku said as even Neltharion had overheard as he slowly turned his head towards Naraku. Even Malagos, Coriol's Trazin. Crassus blinked and looked at Naraku. Did you just call me, sis? Yes I did, because since me and Isera are mates in life, you are my sister-in-law. Which means you are indirectly related to my father as well. Which means we are now related in a sense. He explained as Neltharion, who had many schemes in his head, had a sudden monkey wrench in his plans and he didn't even know how to fix the damage luckily a voice broke up the awkward situation for everyone sorry i'm late sss some situations sss have occurred much to my displeasure a voice spoke up as entering the chamber of aspects came a massive dragon with bronze scales landed as crassus could not believe it nazdormu the dragon aspect of time himself had appeared and now he might have a chance of returning home with ronin the bronze dragon looked at Crassus in his eye, and felt the connection. You must stay here, for you are part of this history. Now Crassus was lost, he was part of what was meant to be. Was he and Ronan supposed to come back in time in order to preserve history? Then what was he supposed to do? Frustrated, he had unknowingly made eye contact with Neltharion, and much to his horror, in those eyes, was the same darkness that was there when he became Deathwing. Not possible, not possible. Crassus thought with disbelief. Neltharion wasn't supposed to be consumed by this evil yet, had history been changed even further? You know me, but I do not know you. The voice of Neltharion rang in his mind. Had Crassus been prepared, he would have been able to resist Neltharion's mind probing, but due to being caught off guard at the discovery of the madness, he was at the Earth Warder's mercy. He prayed, prayed that anyone else would take notice, as Naraku was one who saw it and had narrowed eyes. He prayed to the creators that Naraku would do something, but the look in. Naraku's eyes told him his answer. Play along and don't involve his father in what he wanted to tell the others the truth about Neltharion. You would speak against me, make the others see me as you do. You would have them distrust their comrade of old, their brother. Crassus was surprised. 
Was this dragon able resist the madness like the rest of the black dragonflight were plagued after? Neltharion became Deathwing? In Naraku's eyes, there was a plan of sorts. If this dragon can help stop Neltharion's treachery, then it would help change things for the better. You will not be allowed to spread any of your malicious falsehoods. He feared that Neltharion would strike him down here and now, but turned away. These non-existing threats made Crassus begin. Wondering what Neltharion was up to as he noticed Naraku's lips move in silent as they spelled out two words. Silent spell. So. Neltharion placed a spell that would silence him from saying anything about Neltharion, so much about warning about his betrayal then. I came here for important business involving Naraku. Nazdormu spoke up, gaining everyone's attention as Naraku was tense. This SSS dragon, I discovered upon my duties checking the time stream, plays an important role for the fate of all dragons SSS. He told everyone there, causing even the secretly maddened aspect Neltharion to look at his son with respect. He's what? Crassus thought in shock. He never recalled anything about this dragon and he already plays an important role in the future. Is this maybe why Nazdormu had sent him back in time? To save this dragon from disappearing during the War of the Ancients? Maybe this dragon was the key to preventing Neltharion's betrayal in this time until furthermore in the future? Well that's good and all that, Naraku commented dryly, but right now we're dealing with a demonic invasion that threatens to wipe us all out. So what do we need to do? He asked as Neltharion nodded his head in agreement. Indeed, Naraku makes a valid point. We must deal with this threat before it gets out of hand. He told the bronze dragon leader as he looked at Crassus. He, Nazdormu said referring to Crassus, must find a certain night elf. He will be the key to help SS stopping the invasion. The aspect of time explained as. Crassus nodded. I have one question though, Naraku spoke up. Looking at Crassus with sharp eyes. How dangerous is this demonic invasion and who is the leader behind it, he asked. Crassus felt the gaze in the dragon's eyes peer into his soul. He never felt true intimidation as he felt every little secret about himself being exposed to everyone. He had to tell everything he knew to Naraku, of the demons and the burning legion, their terrible power, and their horrible, evil leader, the dark titan Sargeras. The mere mentioning of the name caused all dragon aspects to go on edge instantly. Who among the dragons have not heard of the betrayer Sargeras? A titan, one who was the champion among the pantheons eons ago. Who betrayed the titans and brought chaos to countless worlds as he devoured them to fill his ravenous appetite. Of how he would devour the heart of Azeroth with great joy. HMPH, I tell Sargeras to bite me, but it seems like he already. Wants to. Neltharion snorted as Malagos laughed at that, due to the fact that the heart of Azeroth being inside Neltharion's chest. Once again, Neltharion's legendary snark strikes again. Coriolstraz commented with respect as Crassus nodded in agreement. Neltharion's snark and the comedian and entertainment skills of Malagos would make them a legendary duo of comedy. It was a dream that would never come to realization due to the Earth Warder's madness. While that is good father, we've got a war to rage. I think it's time to bring out that project you've been working on to change the tides of battle. Naraku interrupted as Neltharion looked at his son and nodded. Crassus had a bad feeling about the project the two were talking about. He just prayed that he wasn't referring to that cursed artifact that doomed the blue dragonflight in the future. My flight and I will help the night elves war against the highborn and the burning legion. It's finally time to suit up and roll out. Naraku grinned as he turned to Isera. Be careful Naraku, I would miss you greatly if anything were to happen to you. Isera said with a sense of concern in her voice was noticeable as Naraku nuzzled her cheek affectionately. Don't worry. I'm too stubborn to die. I'll survive this long enough Isera. He comforted her. Neltharion and Malagos looked away. The atmosphere of romance was already too. Embarrassing to watch. Nazdormu merely blinked at the sight, with a sense of guilt of not spending time with his consort starting to eat away at him due to his duties as the aspect of time. Coriolstraz. Crassus and Alexstrasza found it just romantic and beautiful. With that done, Naraku flexed his wings as he took to the skies and headed towards Mount Hyjal, towards his caves as he prepared to call forth his flight for a war that would scar the world. Nazdormu returned to his duties as the guardian of time, 
preparing for making his next move to make Naraku save his foolish father from his madness. It would take time, but he's got all the time he needs. Why Emerald Dream, seeing what the elves were experiencing in their dreams to see what she could learn of this. Burning Legion and what kind of creatures serving them, hoping that this knowledge she'll gain from it to help the others in the fight ahead. Alex Straza prepared her flight for battle, knowing full well that as the life binder, she must protect the life of Azeroth in order for it to flow. Coriol's Traz and Crassus traveled towards the nearest night elf inhabitant in order to find the one they are meant to seek. Neltharion returned to his lair, ordering members of his flight to capture demons to test his precious dragon soul as he extracted their essence painfully into the artifact. Soon, Neltharion thought as he eyed the golden disc with longing madness. Soon I will rule the new world with Naraku as my champion. And the burning legion will fall. I shall be patient. All will be mine in the end. Naraku made it to his lair, his flight waiting for him as his reptilic face was stern and serious. My fellow brothers and sisters, a war is being waged right now, a war that will decide the fate of the world. Itself, Naraku exclaimed as his flight became sharp and serious, so it is time to bestow my flight a gift that will make us warriors among our kind, Naraku explained, making his flight curious as he walked towards one of the nearest fountains not blessed by any mystic force and shed his blood into the pool as it turned into a color described as the very color of the earth itself. Naraku's inherited memories of his species kicked in. Hell dragons were able to inherit all memories of their kind genetically and telepathically so that any knowledge they had would not be lost. It includes the knowledge on special abilities they could bestow onto other living beings. It would make them the same type of dragon that Naraku was slowly over time from the energies in their bodies, but will be worth it as the most dangerous ability the hell. Dragons could inherit since the dawn of creation is blessed upon them their scales turning into the metal they have devoured. He had a cache of adamantine nearby just in case something like this happened, and now it was time to use it. Drink from this pool, the energies will bestow you a gift that I had. Learned, and will make you closer to the earth like the earth warder and myself, but be warned, with this great power, comes a great price. Those brave to help carry the burden our father Neltharion and I his child carry with our being, drink and be rewarded with the great power within, he told them as the former members of the black dragonflight looked reluctant, as Syntharia stood and walked over to the pool with a determined look. If this means to help my beloved and my son carry this burden and to use this great power to protect the earth itself, I shall accept it all. She proudly proclaimed as she drank from the pool, as her scales became the same level of black that Naraku's were. They were colors of the midnight void. The other members of the darkwing flight felt the power within the prime. Consort of Neltharion grow as Syntharia gritted her teeth. This weight, this is what you and my beloved are forced to carry? She asked as Naraku nodded his head solemnly. Indeed, but the minute you drank from the pool and assimilated the energies, the weight felt a bit lighter than before, even if it was by a small amount. He commented as Syntharia smiled, happy that she was able to help her son and Neltharion with their burdens. This action caused the other members of the flight, the ones who looked up to both Naraku and Neltharion with respect as they too, drank from the fountain as they become closer to the earth itself and felt the weight of the world on them. Amazing, Syntharia muttered as Naraku looked at her. The minute they've drank from the pool, the weight became lighter. She told him as Naraku nodded. Indeed, we are now sharing the burden, which in return, helps reduce the pain on our souls. He told her as the fountain was drained dry as only the drakes and whelps were the only ones left not to drink from the fountain. Sorry young ones, Naraku apologized, I wish to make you just like the rest of us, but we're running low on time. Protect the eggs here and wait for our return. He ordered as the young ones nodded their heads. They would do their best to protect their younger siblings. Waiting to hatch from their eggs. Alex Straza felt it, the power that the night elves near the well of eternity were drawing out. It was a dark, evil force, one that could destroy all life on Azeroth at the leader, Sargeras ever stepped foot upon the world. She had entrusted Neltharion with his, project, that he and Naraku mentioned that might be powerful enough to help. Change the tides of war to their favor. And from what Nazdormu said to the leader of the Darkwing flight, he might have a trick up his sleeve that could also help in this war. She prayed that they would have enough time, 
Crassus and Coriolstras have already left to find the night elf that Nazdormu had mentioned would be the key in ending the invasion of the Burning Legion once and for all. Watch and observe, you must master this within the time limit we have before the next meeting with the aspects and joining in on the war. Naraku told his flight as he held a sliver of adamantine in between his index and thumbnails as he swallowed it. He meditated as he focused on the metal going down his throat. His insides, hot as the molten earth itself melted the metal as he channeled the energies in him to break it down and analyze the blueprints of the metal for instant reproduction. Willing it, the older members of the transformed flight watched in awe as Naraku's scales transformed into pure adamantine with his claws being made of the same material as they were sharp enough to cut through anything else. His wings had forsaken the membrane that covered them as the bones were now exposed and now made of adamantine themselves as he flexed the wings. By breaking down the metal and assimilating it into my being, I am able to recreate it anywhere around my body and create a new set of scales made of the same metal. I have transformed my body into a lethal weapon as I had forsaken my ability of flight to increase my lethality. He explained as he demonstrated how fast his body was. Even with scales made of metal and how sharp his claws were as his metal skeleton wings aided in slashing at invisible opponents. They were impressed, as they were already starting to get the hang of. Walking on two legs to increase their fighting abilities against bigger enemies. The knowledge was flowing into their brains as they too began to follow their leader and assimilate the adamantine and develop the same features as Naraku does. We can discard this form at will, but will take time before we can recreate the adamantine form after we shed it off, Naraku. Explained as he demonstrated how to shed the metal off as he was back to his original form as the membranes returned to his wings. The shed of metal skin was in both quantity and qualities that would have made blacksmiths gap in awe at the sight as the entire flight focused on their training, trying to master their new abilities to the fullest. Several days have passed as Isera appeared to Naraku in his dream. Greetings my beloved, what news do you bring? He asked as he nuzzled her affectionately. She nuzzled him back, much, the flights have agreed to enter the war as Neltharion's newest creation. The dragon soul was completed as we imported a portion of our power into the weapon. It'll take some time before the spell matrix is complete. What are you going to do Naraku? She asked as Naraku looked at her. Me and my flight will go and aid the elves against the demons. Wish me luck my love. He replied as he embraced Isera once more as the dream was slowly coming to an end. When he awoke, it would be for the long-awaited battle of a lifetime. The rebellious night elves fought hard and valiantly against the demon invaders. But the only real backup was a lone red dragon named Ko Mage that rode on its back used his magic to help reduce the numbers of the demonic army. But sadly, that wasn't enough to stop the elves from dying one by one as they were being outnumbered. TCH, at this rate we'll be, Crassus muttered grimly as a roar shook the earth as a dragon that looked as if made of metal landed in front of a fell beast and tore it apart with its claws as other fellow metal dragons landed from above and began slaughtering the demons. The night elves, Crassus, and Coriolstras were amazed by this sight as they watched the metal dragons ruthlessly butcher demon after demon with unrivaled speed as they all stood on their back legs. If Crassus could say anything about these dragons and their fighting prowess, they are beasts stricken with a madness that could not be cured by ordinary means. This madness in their fighting style makes them look savage, brutal, and an unstoppable force of fury that made even the demons start retreating. The night elves cheered on in victory as the supposed leader of the group walked towards Crassus and his past self. How's it going little man? A familiar voice asked from the metal being as Crassus could not believe his eyes. Naraku, is that you? The dragon in disguise asked as the metal dragon nodded. Indeed, I'm sure you're curious of what happened to us, but I'll explain it after the war and such. Naraku told him. Several days have passed and the demons were pushed back. But Naraku had called off his flight to let them rest from the battle as the night elves carried on in their place. Grateful for their help as they fought on viciously, intent on not letting the Darkwing flight's efforts be in vain as they killed many demons in their wake as their numbers kept going. Things were getting out of hand until a certain magic using Night Elf came into the frame and aided in pushing them back by killing more demons. Illidan, Naraku spoke, calling onto his old friend with a toothy smile. Greetings Naraku. I see you and your flight has taken quite a beating. 
Illidan remarked as the leader of the flight laughed. Indeed we have. He bellowed as he looked down at the elf, and I see you're starting to develop a big ego with the use of magic and the instant popularity you're getting. He remarked as Illidan shook his head. Now that you've mentioned it, you're right. I might be getting reckless with my actions. So far, fellow magic users are exhausted and in my blindness they could die if we did not stop here. I wanted to show Tarande that I was worthy, but it still seems I need guidance from you to help me be acknowledged, he agreed as. Naraku nodded. Accepting your flaws are a good thing young elf, Naraku spoke as he pressed a talon over Illidan's heart. But the strength of heart will always surpass the powers of brute strength and magic alone. Remember this Illidan, follow your heart instead of your thoughts, it could be less dangerous for what may lie ahead in your future. He told him as the young knight elf bowed his head in respect. I shall, and thank you friend, for granting me such great wisdom on such a dark day. He replied as the two began speaking of their recent actions in the war. Hmm, these highborn elves will be a problem if we do not know what they will do for their next move. We need a spy amongst them. Naraku muttered as something made him realize something as he looked at Illidan who felt unnerved by that grin. Why am I getting a feeling that I'm going to be involved in something dangerous? He asked with narrowed eyes. Have you ever played double agent before? He asked with a wicked grin. I cannot believe I'm doing this. I'm insane, suicidal, reckless, and a complete idiot for agreeing to do this. Illidan grumbled to himself as he was already working alongside the highborn as he felt the powers of the well of eternity and the whirlpool form it took shape of. If this keeps up, then if what Naraku taught me about constant use of massive sources of magic will. He thought as a horrifying revelation shocked his core. Naraku taught him that great sources of magical energy must not be used constantly, or the results will be disastrous, and he should know. Naraku proved this by giving Illidan a special amulet that contained a massive amount of energy in it and drew from it without restraint on his use of magic. It strained the magical object to the point it exploded. That was what the Well of Eternity is, but a bigger catastrophe just waiting to erupt if there was a massive spell in use. He needed to know more, and to do that, he must gain the Queen's trust. Naraku's body twitched as he felt the curse of all the world's evil take effect and it confused him greatly. The curse he was forced to carry by the wicked gods was meant to target humans, but the problem was, there were no humans in this place. And what's more, the smell of the living dead, a scent that one of his ancestors on the hell dragon species side was familiar with as the genetic memory was imprinted on him. It was enough to gain his curiosity. I'm going to investigate something, rest up and await my return. He ordered his flight as Syntheria nodded her head as it was an unwritten rule that she would be in charge while Naraku was away. Brox the orc had felt an uncontrollable anger take over him as he saw the Nathrism raise the dead at their call. He found this necromancy to be a sacrilege to his kind, dishonoring the spirits themselves as he let loose a war cry that startled the demons as he unleashed his wrath. Within minutes with the use of Cenarius axe, he cleaved the demons by the number, as soon even the undead stilled as they fell. He was accompanied by a human named Ronan, who was a wizard from where he came from as they, along with Kraus, were sent back in time to this and now have discovered the beginning works of the creation of a horror they knew in their time. They know they can't do anything to change that part of the future. That was when the trees shook and fell, as the sounds of giant footsteps came as Brox held his axe in front of him fearlessly as Ronan began gathering as much magic as he can as out of the forest. A dragon that stood on its back legs looked down at them. My, my, what an interesting find. Care to tell me how a human and another creature I do not know of are doing here? Naraku asked. With a raised eyebrow as he sniffed them. They carried scents he did not know about, let me guess, you're not from here, of this era no? He asked as the two mortal beings nodded dumbly, Uncle. Nazdormu, what the hell are you up to? The black dragon grumbled as he gestured them to follow him. Looks like Illidan will have a teacher, and from the way this human was dressed, a professional as well. Several days later, Naraku and his flight followed the trail of destruction and saw the mass of demons there as he let loose a whistle. I say, these fiends can be quite exhausting, E.H. Mage? He asked Ronan. I'll say, this battle can be really taxing right now. Even I can tell you are just as tired. He commented as Naraku nodded. Indeed, but I still fight on to protect those I hold dear. 
Do you fight to protect those you care about? For in this battle, the people you know in your time might not exist anymore. He asked as Ronan nodded his head. I do. I have a wife at home, and she's going into labor. I really want to see her smile and my children when they are born, he replied as Naraku. Looked at the orc. I am not sure about you orc, but I know that you seek redemption of sorts correct? He asked as Brox nodded his head. Indeed Metalheart, I do seek redemption. Brox replied, the title of Metalheart given to Naraku for his abilities over metal. I see, but remember, redemption must be out of your own choice. Sometimes, you must make the choice that might kill you to redeem yourself even if you don't know it. He explained as he looked up at the sky to see many of the dragon flights inbound with Neltharian flying. Look. It is father leading the flights with the dragon soul. He'll use it to help aid us in the battle against Thed. Ronan looked up and saw Neltharian and knew there was one event in history that shook all dragons. No, not now, not now. Neltharian activated the tiny disc in his claws as it flared with a brilliant light as a golden light that was purer than any light seen by mortals alike descend from the heavens, smiting the demons left and right as Naraku and his flight cheered with delight as the demons were pushed back and utterly annihilated by the dragon soul's power as one of the commanders of the Burning Legion, Archimonde knew that his master would be displeased by this development. Naraku saw it immediately, in Neltharian's eyes. There was no Neltharian, no, it was a monster created by the voices of untold horrors had taken over. You, Naraku growled, his red eyes. Glowed dangerously as Neltharian used the dragon soul to freeze the other flights in mid-air except the black flight as Naraku flew at incredible speeds. Father, Naraku roared, crashing into. Neltharian who was bewildered by the sudden attack as Naraku had butted him. You are not my father, what have you done to him demon? He demanded as the aspects and other flights were surprised by Naraku's appearance as Neltharian laughed. I'm sorry, whelp. But Neltharian isn't here at the moment. Please leave a message. The dragon spoke, the voice warped as it spewed lava at Naraku who remained unfazed by it as it glared at the dragon in front of him. I'll snap you back to your senses father, one way or another. He bellowed as he transformed his head into pure adamantine and head butted his father in the skull, putting him. In a daze as Naraku took the dragon soul from Neltharian and kicked off him while still holding it. What sorcery is? Naraku exclaimed in shock as he felt the voices return. Come whelp, bring chaos to this world. Let the foolish elves burn for their actions. They are as bad as humans will once they are born into the world. No, 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 Naraku exclaimed as he felt his body tear up in agony as molten lava erupted from his body as his mass grew as he forced his entire body to become pure adamantine as he fell, losing the ability of flight as a result as Isera, finally free from the dragon soul's influence dived down after him. There's a limit the adamant armor can hold from this power, the whispers of the dragon soul have corrupted father. Naraku realized as he crashed into the ground as Isera, Syntheria and the Darkwing flight dashed towards him. Naraku, they exclaimed. He's not father, not father, the dragon groaned in agony as he still clutched the dragon soul in his claws. It is mine boy, I shall have it back, Neltharian roared as. Syntheria looked up at her mate and saw it in his eyes. It truly isn't my beloved, she whispered. Indeed, it is not Syntheria. A warm familiar voice rang in her ears. Neltharian, but how can? There is no time, push back the monster that has taken over my body, he must not have the dragon soul, the voice of Neltharian. Pleaded as Syntheria shook her head and decided to improve. Naraku's version of the adamant armor by only having her scales change into it, as she still felt light with the metal coating as she charged at the black wyrm above them, you are not my mate. Neltharian, who are you fiend? She demanded with great fury as the black dragon tried to scratch Syntheria, only for the scales of adamantine to absorb the damage as she bit into the monster's arm as she tossed him to the ground. The monster possessing Neltharian got up, shrugging off the attack like it was nothing and chuckled. Foolish Syntheria, it will take. More than that to defeat the likes of me. It bellowed at her as the two fought in midair. The black flight retreated as the other flights took advantage with their numbers as the body of Neltharian was left to fend for himself as he eyed Naraku clutching the dragon soul. I'll be taking back what's mine, 
he said as he manipulated the earth to summon golems as he reclaimed the dragon soul from. Naraku as his own body bloated up as rips appeared on his body. The creature frowned at this development and took off with the dragon soul as he eyed Naraku and saw the adamantine armor he wore. I'll need my own armor now, it thought as it flew to. Neltharion's lair. The aspects destroyed the golems as Malagos looked haunted by the one he had once called brother betrayed him as he quickly rushed to Naraku's side and began analyzing him for any symptoms. Contrary to belief. Whenever a blue dragon accidentally gets hit with a strange spell or something, Malagos observes the symptoms in great attention before finding the right cure for the problem. He's been infused with a great amount of power from the dragon soul. His form he has taken is containing it until he adapts to the sudden changes. He explained as Syntheria sighed with relief along with Isera. I shall take him home to rest. I'll lead the Darkwing flight in this war in his stead until he is recovered. She spoke as Isera spoke up. I wish to accompany him, I am concerned of what the dragon soul might. Influence on his mind and when he dreams, I shall know. She told her as Syntheria agreed to it. To Mount Hygel, and with haste. Kraus, Coriolstras, Brox, Illidan and Malfurion in their respect areas separate from each other had seen the power of the dragon soul, of Neltharion's betrayal, and Naraku's anger. Illidan knew magic was powerful but seeing the dragon soul in action proved that the elves were still behind in that part. But the way Naraku reacted to the artifact told him that it might be cursed by some sort of ancient evil that could make him pay the price for it if he were reckless. But it seems that the dark titan Sargeras has an interest in this artifact. He wants to use its incredible power to help open a portal to summon him to Azeroth, due to Illidan's wits to keep himself. Informed of what they were planning, Sargeras decided to reward him with his new eyes and tattoos to boost his powers. I must accept this course if I am to save Tyrande and Malfurion. He thought as he was dragged away to recover from the gift by Sargeras. Illidan dashed through the forests, recovered from his gift from Sargeras as he and his assigned party sought for the infamous dragon soul that had decimated the many warriors of the Legion and had caused Naraku great pain as he fell. He was certain that his giant friend is recovering from whatever the artifact had done to him and will return to the battle soon. For now, he had to worry about the situation he was in. If any one of the night elves find him with these highborn, he'll be no doubt it'd be labeled as a traitor, unless of course Naraku bails him out of course. Sometimes he wonders how he always gets himself into these kinds of situations, he blames Naraku for that. Isera worried greatly for her mate as Naraku refused to transform into his normal state as Malagos began his magical operation with precise caution. Such power is dangerous when the dragon soul came into contact with both Neltharion and Naraku, he spoke up. The energies of its matrix surged into them, causing their bodies to tear apart from the overload. While it makes them stronger, it's destroying them from within. But Naraku is adapting to the surge, channeling it into his adamantine scales. I'm helping with the transfer right now. Once it's over, he can shed the metal off and the contained powers within. He explained as Isera nuzzled Naraku gently as the black metal dragon groaned weakly. He was unconscious for now, but if he were to wake up, he'll feel intense pain. And their yet to be born clutch would be fatherless if they hatch one day after this war is over. Malfurion entered the Emerald Dream as he followed the sinister black dragon that Naraku had described to be his father Neltharion. Despite the fact said dragon in front of him has lava fissures and was in a foul mood. But no dragon soul. As the young druid figured the beast had hidden it somewhere safe as it ordered goblins to create armor for it. Malfurion focused as he tried to sense Thenali found it, hidden well as he began to go and get it. He, needed to get this artifact and help his friends prevent another disaster from ever happening again. Thief, roared the molten dragon as hot metal was freshly embedded into its scaly flesh as its eyes were ablaze. With fury, things just got complicated, Malfurion thought as he prepared to make his escape. Illidan would have blinked if he had eyes and not had a blindfold on, as he was, seeing, that dragon from earlier unleashing a path of destruction with a breath of lava as it seemed to be chasing something. And if Illidan were to bet his money, someone had just stolen the dragon soul. And the main question was who it was. He'd better hurry, if anything, it could be his brother, and not to mention he had men following him as well, 
keeping an eye on him. The Legion is a cautious one as ever. Well, at least the Warglaives he acquired before joining the Legion proved to be useful, despite the fact their full potential is sealed away at the moment. But he'll manage, and when the time comes, the Legion will pay dearly for harming his home and killing his fellow elves in their urge of conquest. Naraku flailed violently as he slammed into the cavern wall as his adamant armor began falling, carrying cracks of malicious energy in it as Malagos was baffled by the development as Naraku's scales seemed to mix with the shadows. Gah, why does it burn? Naraku roared in anger as his eyes shone a level of redness that seemed sinister-like in appearance as his metal armor was falling apart completely, exposing his normal dragon form. Malagos observed the fallen armor's energies and gagged in disgust like he had smelt something putrid. By the makers, what foul curse is etched into you my boy? Malagos exclaimed as Syntheria and Isera heard as they tried to quell Naraku's fit. Isera had a faint recollection of the curse in Naraku's dreams. It was a foul, sinister thing of pure evil. Looking at it was merely revolting, and it was as if the thing inside of him was alive in a sense. A curse, of the gods, was the faint reply of the hell dragon as Malagos narrowed his eyes. Gods, as in the old gods? He asked as Naraku merely slumped to the wall, barely conscious. Kill the human, slaughter him, burn his children. The curse known as all the world's evil was something Naraku lived with every day that the gods that sent him here had forced him to carry in his soul. Something that was specially made to kill only human beings as other sentient races seem to be unaffected. Is it because humans are greedy, arrogant, and lusting than most races with their infant history? Or was it so those gods can control the humans into worshipping them by having a great evil that they need to be saved from vanquished? In the beginning, the curse was in a dormant state, unable to start these mad whisperings that were worse than the ones his father Neltharion is plagued with. That human from the future, the mage Ronan had somehow stirred the ancient curse in him and after making contact with the dragon soul, caused the curse to go into frenzy. His mind was being torn right now. He needed help, despair was consuming him. G. N. Raku, a voice, calling out to him. Darkness embraced Naraku as his mind went blank, and only madness inside of him had awoken. Kill the mage. What's happening? Malagos exclaimed as Syntheria and Isera backed away from Naraku as his eyes opened up, showing all consuming red as nothing, showing but the red madness in the eyes as Naraku's form was turned into a living shadow as the beast roared and bursted out of the mountain. The curse has awakened. Isera realized as she knew she must stop her mate from becoming a bigger threat to the war or else die as an enemy. I'll gather my flight, Isera. Warn the night elves to be wary of Naraku. Malagos called out as he took off after Naraku. I'm coming too. Syntheria shouted as the prime consort of Neltharion flew after her corrupted child. I must destroy and hate mankind. Humans must be destroyed. Naraku roared as his shadowy form instilled fear upon all who gazed upon his shadowy form as he began laying a path of destruction in his wake as fire of blackish malice erupted from his mouth and reduced everything around him to ruins. The night elves prayed to a loon to quell the beast's rage, the demons of the legion cower before something far more sinister than themselves, and from the depths of the twisting nether, watching from his throne, the dark titan Sargeras raised a brow in interest of this dragon of shadows. I believe I have found my own dragon aspect of destruction, he mused with a grin on his fiery face. Naraku groaned as he realized he was in his own mind, and he saw it the black sun dancing in the imaginary sky as the land was filled with evils. I blame you Deus for this fucking curse, making me the symbol of evil, for your own ambitions, a self-righteous god who wants everything to be perfect. While I'm not playing it when I'm in a war, he snarled as he flew up to the black sun. Alright, Angra mind you, your games end before they can start. Naraku snarled as he collided with the black sun and felt the black mud of the black sun and was dragged in. No do not interfere with my task. Please, it's just one human from the future. Like you need to go crazy like that for a simple thing. Naraku retorted. I was created to punish and destroy humans, to become the ultimate symbol of evil. Just like the original Angra Mainyu. The being replied in monotone, as if reciting a duty it must not fail. What a joke. You think so narrow-minded, 
Why, there are other things you can do to make yourself the ultimate evil. But how are you going to perfect yourself as the symbol of evil? Without the right training? Naraku mocked as it got the entity's attention. What are you getting at? Angra Mainyu asked. It's not just humans that are evil. Other humanoids beings are evil too. Plus, I don't think Deus would want other humanoid beings. Worshipping other things besides him no? Naraku asked, baiting the artificial god dwelling within him. That's just it. You think that the evils of humanity is fine alone. But you see, there are other types of evil out there that does not follow humans. If you want to be like the original Angra Mainyu, you have to learn about more evils that do exist. Once you've evolved in both knowledge and power, can you call yourself a true symbol of evil? Naraku told him logically. Your logic is acceptable. For I believe I want to become the ultimate evil known to all, yet I lack the knowledge and power to do so. Using your body is the only thing close to power, it agreed. It's not enough. Even I don't have enough knowledge or training for that. But there is one final evil out there that I doubt even you can't possess with all your might. Naraku said with a knowing tone. And that is, it asked, curious of the answer, slaying God. The words Naraku said had struck a chord in the artificial god of darkness as it immediately checked every evil it had under its possession, and realized it did not have the sin of man slaying God. It was the ultimate sin that embodied what it means to be truly evil. That is true, how can there be any despair, any fear, as long as an almighty deity rules all in his light? I do not have this sin in my collection. I must devour the holy light of the gods who bring order. Return all to the void of chaos and relinquish in the everlasting darkness in the hearts of all. Yet I do not possess any of the three. Knowledge, power, and death of a god. How can I truly be the ultimate evil if I cannot do that? The curse realized as Naraku realized that it was actually sounding ashamed of itself. How can a curse given life feel like that? He will never know. You can, but you are a young artificial god of darkness, and you will need much learning. Give me back my body, and I'll teach you. Naraku assured it, knowing he was gambling with a dangerous dark force here as the curse, raised, and do I have your word dragon? The word of a dragon is truth and absolute. Once you agree, then the pact is made. It asked, cautious of what the deal is entailing. Do I get my body back afterwards? Only after the presence of that human is gone. He's got the filth of an arrogant human mage in his body. And I hate arrogant mages more than regular humans. They're what others would call cliché villains in popular culture. And being a force of evil, I find it insulting for a mere human mage to be a great evil. It said with a mild sense of distaste in its tone. Naraku blinked at how. Well versed this, source of all evil, is in knowing what evil is defined in human pop culture in a, normal, reality in a different world. Might as well align myself with some beings that are enemies of humans once time goes by. Naraku mused to himself dryly. Very well then, Avenger. You have my word. Avenger, the curse asked, confused. You carry the hatred in your very existence caused by human evil and you seek vengeance in blood because you exist to seek vengeance on humanity. Like an avenger. Plus I don't think you're worthy of being called Angra Mainyu until you prove yourself. Unless you want me to name you Sasuke Uchiha? Naraku asked with a grin. Avenger it is. This, Sasuke, in my recordings is a failure of an avenger, and I do not want to be like that. The being agreed. Immediately upon hearing about the other option for a name and from its tone, Dislike the name Sasuke. Very well then, but don't harm anyone I care about or you'll regret it, Naraku warned. Understood, instructor Naraku. The newly named Avenger replied. The dragon made of shadows blew forth unholy flame from its shadowy maw as it decimated the forests and all that were within range. Chaos erupted unto the battlefield as demons were pushed back as the elves instinctively retreated. The night elves knew not to face a dragon when on a rampage, unless you wanted to die. Avenger was in control now, its form shifting as it looked for the mage called Ronan, the human from the future. The blood of a human begged to be drank from a chalice of poison and Avenger knew that feeling since the moment it was created by Deus. Once then shall it give its host his body back. Naraku, approaching enemy. Isera, mate of instructor Naraku. Do not engage in combat. Avenger thought with memorizing the details of who was friend and who was an enemy of Naraku's. 
Avenger flexed its wings as the moonlight was swallowed by the shadow it casted as within that shadow, the forest was plagued with corruption that devoured life behind it as Avenger flew off. It knew it could not harm anyone Naraku cared for under their pact, and they are bound to each other and it needs cooperation in order to fulfill its mission as the ultimate evil. But now this, burning legion, is ruining everything at the moment as it sensed a powerful being filled with evil within it. Avenger only knew of evils committed by humans, but not that of demons, which were humanoids. Were these demons similar? A dark sense of delight filled it as Avenger roared and dived, swiping up the closest fell guard in its claws and immediately devoured it, body and soul and absorbed its knowledge. Avenger was amazed by the evils this burning legion had committed, far much worse than what humans of the modern civilization of Earth in the 21st century could create. And now that knowledge is added to its collection of evils, it needed more, and a gnawing hunger for darkness grew. Avenger, grinned, with Naraku's shadowy form and bellowed a bloodlust roar as its eyes glowed ominously in the moonlight as it harnessed Naraku's powers over the natural elements of the planet. Bending the materials and water within the forest as both Isera and Malagos bore the most horrific sight to behold. The trees erupted with great anger as their branches impaled both elf and demon alike as their blood fell and screams of agony filled the air. As the very moon itself turned red at the battlefield as Isera knew Elune was grieving at the slaughter. Avenger stood in the lake of blood, bathed in the red moonlight as the twisted forest littered. With corpses spiraled into the sky, giving off a level of fear and despair as the demon dragon chuckled. Welcome everyone, it spoke, as it proceeded to walk towards its destination. To hell. It finished ominously as the dragon made of shadows grinned sinisterly in the light of the blood moon. Sargeras was impressed by the wickedness of the dragon, and was disturbed a little of how it turned the very environment around it into a sea of blood as even called Jaden and Archimond at the sight of the brutality this beast had brought upon both night elves and demons. Bring me this wyrm, Sargeras spoke, surprising his too high ranking in commands. My own dragon aspect of death and destruction is there, and I want it. It will teach the pantheon that their own dragon aspects cannot match up to mine. He told them as Archimond was the one to bow his head. I shall go and acquire your dragon my lord. The demon lord spoke as he turned and walked away. Kuljadin merely eyed the creature from the portal as it continued a warpath, as if seeking something. One thing you must never do is steal something from a dragon. If you do, expect chaos, and wanton destruction chasing after you, especially if you've stolen from the newly named traitor Deathwing himself who is currently leveling the area around him in lava in his fit of rage as his precious dragon soul was stolen from him. He could not sense it, but right now, his body was burning with a different pain as he felt the weight of the earth itself lighten, but that wasn't the source. It was a poison of wanton hatred so strong it even causes his damaged mind incredible pain. And as he knew the thief stole his beloved dragon soul was gone for now. He will find it another time as the increasing pain kept pestering him as he sensed the source and decided to put an end to it before it gave him more margarines. The hatred was similar to his, and the madness too, that he could sense as his adamantine armor shone in the blood red moon as he saw a living shadow on a warpath. That was the source of his headaches, and he did not like that. With a roar, Deathwing charged, spewing breaths of lava upon the shadow as it roared in defiance as it took to the skies, challenging him. Deathwing, to a dogfight. A challenge that Deathwing himself accepted, tempting to put that whelp in its place. Enemy. Neltharian, Earth Warder. Engage? Eliminate him, that's not my father. Just a puppet to some foul gods chained beneath the planet. Naraku retorted with venom in his voice. Very well, slaying fake Neltharian now. Avenger roared as the clouds gathered in the sky as the night became pitch black as thunder roared in the sky. He had slept within Naraku for far too long to not get any pleasure of battle. War, blood, death, it caused the dark beings, blood, to boil with excitement as Avenger fired a stream of scarlet flames at Deathwing who retaliated with a breath of lava. The two elements clashed as Isera and Malagos were taken aback by this situation. They're fighting each other. This would not bode well for anyone down below, Isera noted. As Malagos saw something else in this, I've detected a homing link in Naraku's curse, and it seems to be steering into a different direction. 
If I can cut off the presence of whatever is causing this curse to take hold of him, maybe he'll snap back. Malagos told her as Isera nodded her head. Then go, I'll keep anyone down below where Naraku and Neltharion are fighting safe from any stray attacks. She told him as Malagos quickly took off to find the source, beating his wings as hard as he felt the strain from intense effort already taking over him. Deathwing bit into Avenger's arm as Avenger's own jaw sank into the neck of Deathwing's, the wanton hatred emitting from the malefic dragon was so strong it went through the adamantine plates and into the scaly flesh. The heat from both the evils of Avenger and the fiery mad both to be too hot for each other as they separated as Avenger noticed his shadowy layer on his arm was gone, exposing the flesh of Naraku within as soon it was covered again with the shadows. Shadow layer is not strong enough to endure powerful blows. Must use speed and avoid close combat. Avenger thought to itself as it looked at Deathwing who merely grinned at it. Now it mentally cursed itself as it realized Deathwing now had a new strategy as well. Flapping its wings, Avenger dived towards a visible river and knew Deathwing was in pursuit. Gliding over the water, it began evasive maneuvers to avoid Deathwing's foul breath attacks as Avenger. Quickly did a somersault and was right behind Deathwing and bit into the armorless tail, causing the mad aspect to roar in pain at that attack as the malice in Avenger's teeth corroded the scales and bone in the tip of the tail as Deathwing slammed Avenger into the river as it made the shadow dragon unleash its grip as it sank in the water. Blasted whelp, how dare you bite my precious tail and ruin it, Deathwing demanded as Avenger swam beneath the water like a serpent with incredible speed and was mentally rolling its eyes at. What Deathwing said, I knew some dragons can be vain about certain things, but the tail, seriously. Avenger thought as it was near a waterfall and erupted from the water and took to the skies again, only for Deathwing to tackle it from behind and caused the both of them to crash into the ground. I'll show you to never mess with the new god of this world. Deathwing snapped as he grabbed Avenger's head and repeatedly slammed it into the ground, harder and harder with every blow. Avenger reacted quickly and wrapped its tail around Deathwing's neck and tightened its grip, attempting to choke the mad aspect as Deathwing grabbed the tail with both arms in an attempt to rid of the restraint. That gave Avenger enough time to turn and blast a stream of fire in Deathwing's face, causing the dragon to get off it as Avenger quickly took to the skies as the shadow layers over. Naraku's body were heavily damaged. Avenger needed to end this fast. Instructor Naraku, do you have any knowledge of any long-range attacks besides the breath weapon? Avenger mentally asked as Naraku snorted from within. Of course, duh. I'm a hell. Dragon, a dragon attuned to the very forces of nature itself. You can use the lightning itself as a weapon. And that thing does have metal on it so it's nothing more than a mere lightning rod. The dragon replied as Avenger nodded its head. Avenger, felt, the knowledge being implanted into its mind as it now had a grin on its, face, as it raised a claw into the sky as thunder roared in the sky. Whatever you think you can do, whelp, it is useless. Deathwing bellowed as he charged at Avenger with a crazed maniacal delight at the thought of ripping the dragon apart as Avenger's, grin grew even more. No Neltharian, Avenger spoke up, you will disappear, in a thunderclap. It replied as the lightning in the sky gathered and transformed into something. Isera shielded the group of night elves from another bolt of lightning as she turned towards the sky and if her eyes were opened, they would have been opened wide with shock at the sight before her as the night elves themselves were doing so in her place. Up in the sky, the lightning had gathered and gained a shape into a creature no one could describe as the dragon made of shadows had an insane laugh. Ahahaha. Farewell Neltharian. I'll send you to the pits of hell with this attack. The dragon exclaimed, cruelty evident in its tone as Deathwing was flabbergasted by the sight of the being of thunder as the shadow dragon swung its arm down. Kieran, it roared as the being of lightning charged at Deathwing and he could not react for even a split second as he was hit with over million volts of electricity in one strike as he was sent crashing into the ground with the massive surge of thunder toppling him as a giant crater erupted from impact causing a shockwave to erupt as forest fires burst into life. By the gods, Elune protect us, a night elf swore as Isera would have agreed as she mentally prayed to the makers that this chaos would be stopped soon. He's still alive, going in for the. Whatever Avenger was thinking was interrupted as it looked around in immediate distress and confusion as it gained Naraku's attention. What now? 
Weren't you going after that human mage Ronin from the future? He asked mockingly as Avenger roared in frustration. My prey, gone. I cannot sense my prey. It raged mentally as Naraku mentally sighed. So basically, he's dead right? Naraku questioned as the dark entity in control actually sobbed. Gone. Go take control, it said as the shadows on the dragon's body began fading away as. Naraku was freed from the curse's influence as he felt Avenger's presence recede to the back of his mind. What a strange fellow, maybe this is what it's like for a Jinchuriki conversing with their biju no? He mentally mused to himself as he looked around with a confused expression. Where the hell am I? He asked out loud as he saw a giant blue humanoid being heading. Towards him. That doesn't look friendly. He noted as he avoided a swipe from the giant being's arms as knew right off the bat it was an enemy. It was a bit taller than him, or they were roughly the same size and it looked like it wanted to capture him. That was when the roar of Syntheria herself was made known as she tackled. Archimonde from the side, knocking the demon lord down as Naraku looked at his mother in awe and shock. I was lucky to have been able to make such an enchantment in time. Malagos sighed in relief as Ronan looked at the amulet on his neck with confusion. I would love to have an explanation of why the famed dragon aspect of magic appeared out of nowhere and put this amulet on me. The confused human mage of the future said as he noticed Malagos was out of breath at the moment. Had, to, keep you safe. Phew, Malagos panted as he let out a sigh of relief. I really need to work out more if I'm this winded out so easily, he. Laughed as Ronan had a wry smile on his face. Mages nowadays don't do physical activities so they're vulnerable to enemies that get too close for physical combat. Luckily he's not like that typical kind of mage. But on the other hand, what do you mean by, safe? He demanded as Malagos regained his composure. Naraku has a curse of some sort etched into his soul. Not sure what kind, but it's far older than I and it seems to be drawn to you, whatever you are. All I did was separate your presence from its ability to detect you. From the way the atmosphere has calmed, Naraku is back to normal. He explained with a more relaxed tone and relief in his eyes. You mean that horrifying atmosphere that was even unnerving the demons was actually Naraku? Ronan asked with disbelief in his tone. He recalled meeting that dragon, and he looked like a fun guy you'd like to hang out with in a bar for some good merrymaking. He didn't expect that dragon alone being able to terrify demons with his mere presence alone. Now that was something that surprised him. Of course, who else? Neltharion, the aspect of magic asked before laughing full-heartedly, although on the inside, he was grieving at the loss of one he once called brother. Ronan merely shrugged as he blasted the head of a fell hound apart as more came charging through. He wanted to get back to his wife, who was on her way in giving birth and he'd be damned if he didn't get the chance to see his own children be born right in front of him. And right now, the dragon, demon, soul must be collected from the highborn or else this era will end with the legion victorious. Brother, why? Malfurion asked, his eyes blindfolded as he was bumping into things as the restraints on his arms pulled him forward. Illidan had stayed silent for that. As he and the assigned highborn elves to his team had acquired the dragon soul from his now captive brother and proceeded to move back to the well of head to tell his brother that he was working as a double agent for Naraku, to learn what the highborn were up to and what horrifying discoveries he had made. He wished to warn the others of the inevitable explosion from the well if the highborn kept using its powers to summon more demons and eventually Sargeras himself. But no, there were eyes and ears everywhere and Illidan must keep his act and guard up at all times until he can find a place to tell his brother without prying eyes or ears. But the current problem right now. Undo the blindfold, with his visibility completely zero. It'd take us even longer to get back to Queen Azishara, and I don't think she would like to be kept waiting. Illidan spoke up as one of the soldiers saluted him as he undid Malfurion's blindfold as the young druid in training noticed a hidden gesture from Illidan. He nodded his head understanding that once the two brothers are alone, will Illidan finally explain why he had sided with the highborn, but for now, he had to act like a prisoner of war. Deathwing erupted from the smoking crater he was in and shook his body as it tingled from the infusion of electricity. Had he been a normal dragon, he would have definitely died from that attack, but he was earth warder, and he was able to channel most of the electricity into the ground and minimize the damage. Although parts of his hide was scorched from the attack, he'll live. 
but he'll be a bit twitchy for a while. But the mad aspect chuckled as he realized that he was fighting Naraku the whole time, and grinned as he watched the young WYRM and Syntheria fight the demon right now. Next time boy, Deathwing mused as he stretched his wings and took flight, retreating and tending his wounds and damaged armor. He'll reclaim his precious dragon soul later when the time was right. Syntheria snarled at the blue demon that dared to lay its filthy hands on her child, and as her transformed dragon blood pumped through her veins, her rage intensified like a raging volcano as the demon smirked at her, as if looking down at her. Two could play that game. Her dragon body was transformed and is closer to what Naraku's form resembled as she began for the first time, stand on her back. Legs as the blue demon's smirk fell right in front of her as she towered over him. She was much bigger and taller than him, as she was twice his size as she hissed with the wrath of an angry mother dragon. Frankly, not only is she taller than Naraku or Archimonde, her size made even Isera who was there to gap in shock and awe of her mother-in-law as she noticed how different the former prime consort of Neltharion was as she unleashed an ear-splitting roar that echoed throughout the battlefield as both elves and demons alike stopped to look at the source of the roar as they all gapped and dropped there. Weapons in shock, dread, and awe. Her roar echoed for seven miles away and it unnerved other battlefields as Syntheria glared at. Archimonde and slammed her fist into his face, knocking him onto his back hard. Scary, mother is scary, Naraku thought with a shudder, he knew how terrifying mothers were, but now his mother took it to a whole new level as he watched his mother brutally deliver a curb stomp battle onto that blue demon that in his perspective was on a different level from the other members of the burning legion, he actually had to look away from it, because he had a feeling if he kept watching, he'll have nightmares for several hundred years. He regretted muffling his ears as now he was hearing screams of pain that was definitely not his mother's as he shuddered violently. Highborn Palace Illidan opened up the prison cell and walked in, looking down at his brother from behind his blindfolds as he sat down near his brother and sighed. Sargeras is planning on using the dragon soul to open a portal strong enough to let him into Azeroth, but that's the least of our worries. Illidan told his brother as Malfurion looked at his brother in shock. It's the least of our worries. You sided with Azishara and the Legion, betraying me and Tarande, and you're saying the arrival of Sargeras is the least of our worries? He exclaimed as Illidan kept his composure and looked at his twin brother, hard. The strain from the constant use of the well is reaching its limit. It will implode and an explosion unlike any other would destroy virtually everything. Within its blast radius, including us, and I take offense to your comments of betraying, I'm playing double agent on Naraku's behalf to see what the Legion is up to, and now that we've found out, we've got to eliminate the summoners and reclaim the dragon soul before they succeed in bringing Sargeras into this world. That made Malfurion shut up as he took time to process the information he was told, and frankly, he had to agree on those as he figured Naraku would do this, and he had seen what the amulet Naraku gave Illidan did when overused. The Well of Eternity was a gigantic version of that amulet and that spelt bad news. I had just gotten recent news, Tarande is prisoner here as well. But I have a plan that'll get the three of us out of this. Illidan told him as Malfurion was surprised by the news as he looked at his brother. What plan? He asked as Illidan smirked. I've learned more than just the strengths of this palace, there are a few, flaws the Highborn have overlooked and our allies should be making their entrance soon. Once the chaos starts, go to your right, the other cells are down there and Tarande is in one of them. I'm going to join up with the others in reclaiming the dragon soul. He replied as Malfurion nodded his head. Then I wish you well brother, he told Illidan as his brother looked at him. And do I, I wish you and Tarande the best of things in the future, and please, give me nieces and nephews. He told his brother as Malfurion's cheeks darkened. A blush version for night elves. As Illidan dashed out with the cell door open as an explosion echoed not too far off. How did he know, Malfurion thought, wondering how Illidan knew of his love for Tarande. Those weapons, Illidan noted as he eyed a night elf with. Warglaives similar to his own albeit more demonic in power. Looks like you are prepared. He mused as he led his fellow elves into combat against the demons as they began sabotaging the incoming. Flow of demons being summoned up from the Well of Eternity. If only you knew, the supposed, elf, thought dryly as those blades he had were Illidan's future incarnations. 
This mission should give time to get people to evacuate the area before the well of eternity explodes, because from the way the water is turning, there is a lot of strain in the usage of it as it won't go down quietly if the dragon soul was used to open a portal for Sargeras from within the well. He wasn't sure if the inevitable explosion will kill the Dark Titan, but Illidan was certain that Sargeras could die from the amount of force the explosion would cause, if not, then it's the end of the world. Battlefield Naraku finally looked at his mother as Archimonde was literally sent flying in the form of a sparkling star in the sky and his jaw dropped. Hell dragons were strong enough to lift continents at the right age, and his mother, a recently converted into one had thrown an Eridar demon lord into the sky and beyond. If that feat was to be recorded in history, Syntheria would definitely be hailed as a legend. That and she's a tough mama that not even Naraku would want to pick a fight with. Proven that mothers are more terrifying than even. Legendary Dragon Slayers. Now Naraku, Syntheria spoke up, turning to her son with narrowed eyes. Care to explain what that was about? She asked in a tone. That mothers usually have when they find out something you've been hiding and they don't like it. It gave chills down Naraku's spine as he could have sworn he heard Avenger laughing from the depths of his mind, as if enjoying his predicament right now. Well that's kind of a... Long story mom, and can I explain so after the war? He asked nicely as he can pierced him. It was scary how mothers of any species can give off this terrifying aura that brings fear in the hearts of others. Kashina Uzumaki rivals Syntheria in the scariest mother list right now. Fine, but know this Naraku. You're grounded for months once this is over. She told him as Naraku inwardly sobbed in defeat. He was spared from a much more terrifying fate that Nefarian and Anixia had suffered years ago before he created his own flight and he thanked whatever entity that saved him from gaining a harsher punishment. Even Neltharion was scared of whatever punishments she brings out onto her own children. So, what's the plan now? Naraku asked as Syntheria looked at her son. We reclaim the dragon soul and destroy it, restore the balance of power before. Neltharion reclaims it. She replied as Naraku nodded his head, only for both to freeze as they turned towards the direction of the Well of Eternity. Mother, did you sense that? Naraku asked as Syntheria nodded her head. I did. A powerful portal is being created, and the powers of the aspects are there. I believe we found our target, she said as. Naraku narrowed his red eyes. Better regroup and let the wounded stay behind and heal, because right now they're gathering all their forces for a final invasion, and we need to stop them before. Sargeras comes. Naraku spoke in the tone fitting of a leader as. Isera landed nearby, my flight is joining with the other ones in the battle. Sargeras must not be summoned, she exclaimed as Naraku and Syntheria agreed. We must do whatever it takes to stop the Legion's master from coming at all costs. Deep below the planet, they stirred, writhing arms and insane. Laughters as the old gods glee with the plan. They will use this chance to reclaim freedom from the prison the foul titans had imposed upon them, and make Sargeras wish for a death that will never come, as Naraku will be the instrument of their return. But even if the portal plan fails, there are always new ones in motion. Plans within plans, and when the time comes, they shall return and return the world back into a primordial hell it originally was meant to be. But for now, this plan is top priority. The dragons of Naraku's flight as said leader himself looked on in utter disbelief at the amount of demons coming in like ants from an ant hill as he noticed Illidan and a group of brave night elves were destroying certain demonic structures that are halting the incoming army. Quickly, thin out the demons to give the elves a chance. I'm going to reclaim the dragon soul. Naraku barked out as he charged at the very place where the soul was hovering, over the eye of the well of eternity, now resembling a giant whirlpool. As he flew towards the dragon soul, he sensed something dark and powerful, eviler than Avenger is as he looked down to see a portal down below forming and he saw it. A distorted form of beauty and fiery corruption as its eyes of hatred stared upon his own eyes. Naraku knew without a doubt, this was the dark titan himself. He saw a revelation, of Neltharians and even his own future as the corruption would destroy their once noble bodies into twisted, burning forms like Sargeras' own. He blinked, and he heard the dark titan laugh. You will be mine dragon, very soon, the voice spoke, sending chills down his spine as he had a bad feeling about what Sargeras had said. 
That was when he felt it, an evil emitting from the dragon soul itself as Naraku flew a few yards away from it and narrowed his eyes. Old gods, he growled, seems father had some interesting allies in creating this fouled trinket. He commented as he saw the other dragon aspects, including Nas Dormu himself coming this way. But that wasn't the only problem as a roar, a roar. Resembling a raging volcano as demonic bats that were in the sky fell from the impact of a deranged and very determined deathwing. Naraku wisely flew away from the dragon soul and mused darkly of what would happen if deathwing were to try to reclaim the dragon soul when the old gods protect it. He seized the golden disc with some resistance, but was sent flying, dropping the soul which Malfurion down below caught as they all saw the portal beginning to open wider. Naraku. A voice called out as it was Illidan on a balcony nearby as Naraku dashed downwards and landed next to him, only to be hit. With a blast of arcane energy, shaking his head, he turned to see Azishara herself, in all of her proclaimed beauty standing there as. Naraku noticed Illidan was injured terribly. This made Naraku angry, Illidan, go find Malfurion and make sure the dragon soul is in safe hands. This bitch is mine. He growled as he began to step towards the highborn queen as her guards came rushing in, spears, swords and spells ready to harm the wyrm as Naraku chuckled darkly. Arrogant mongrels. Naraku sneered with disgust. Learn your place in taking on a high-class hell dragon. He bellowed as the entire palace shook from his roar. Illidan, hesitant in leaving his friend alone with such a powerful opponent, held his injured side and quickly dashed off hoping to find his brother and make sure he was safe and that no demons killed him. He was willing to sacrifice even his own life to see Tyrande and Malfurion happy together and never sad even with his death, he learned from Naraku one thing, to make the people you truly care for happy, you sometimes must sacrifice something in exchange. Azishara looked as Naraku shrunk to a humanoid form, not of Torin, Night Elf, Troll, or even any creature she was familiar with. Spiky shaggy long black hair, dark feral whisker marks on his tanned cheeks, and cold blue eyes containing unbridled fury in them. And also quite handsome, the queen thought as Naraku chuckled. It's been a while since I took on my human form, he mused as the highborn elves wondered what a human was, and the fact that me, Naruto or Tenryu were never born with the ability to produce chakra. I would have wondered which is more powerful. He mused before chuckling darkly as some of the guards noticed their weapons were bending backwards very slowly. However, I still have my own abilities to take into account. Ninjutsu has gotten so overrated nowadays when I was fighting Madara. He added as he with smirk, made the weapons impale their owners. While the spell casters were froze when Naraku snapped his fingers. Pathetic elves, did you think your arcane abilities can save you from my powers? He demanded as he began walking forward to the only one not frozen by his command, Azishara. You, who were born onto this planet, taking in the minerals of this earth, think you can easily defeat the one who provided what you need to survive? He growled as Azishara frowned at him as she was slowly beginning to cast her magic. Protein, iron, calcium, potassium, sulfur, sodium, chlorine, and magnesium. All minerals in this planet that make up a living being's body besides certain other elements. They are your bones, your muscles, even your very heart. Itself is composed of these minerals to a degree, and something only my kind can control. He sneered as with a snap of his fingers. The sorcerers and sorceress of Azishara's court were forced to fire their spells at their queen. Much to their horror as Azishara with an elegant twist of her wrist, nullified the spells. Interesting. I think Lord Sargeras would love to learn of these interesting secrets you dragons have hidden from us for so long. She mused as Naraku snorted. Nature versus Arcane, the forces of nature against the illogical power of magic. This was the battle Naraku was facing against the highborn queen Azishara. Fire spewed out from his roar as Azishara raised a barrier, smirking as the flames danced around her harmlessly as she failed to notice that Naraku was in the flames as he had charged with his fingernails turned into claws of adamantine as he charged it with the energies of the planet and with a savage roar of defiance. He pierced through the barrier and tore it down with his bare hands before head-butting the startled Azishara in the forehead. The queen blood dripped from her forehead as she widened her eyes in shock at how she was injured by the being in front of her as he smirked savagely. 
Her pride of how her face was tarnished in front of Sargeras infuriated her. Willing it, she drew a massive amount of arcane energy from the well of eternity as she glared at Naraku's human form that narrowed his eyes at the sight. He responded in kind as he drew upon the very planet itself as the earth shook from the surge of power the two opponents were drawing out. But this did not go unnoticed as the surge of powers destroyed the roof and walls of the palace as the dragon saw it. Deathwing sensed it after being thrown back by the dragon soul and knew Naraku was responsible for this unrivaled surge of power. Smiling darkly at how his heir has grown, he will train his child into a force of nature that will rule all. If he were to fall, then Naraku will be the one to rule this wretched planet as its god. All he needed to do was nurture and groom him into one that cannot be beaten, for now, he must retreat and bid his time to reclaim his precious dragon soul. Then Naraku will be brought to him to begin his destiny, the one that Nazdormu had foresaw. He watched from afar, as Naraku's mortal guise and the elf queen clashed powers causing an explosion of nature and arcane energies that destroyed the palace as Naraku and the queen Azishara fell into the well of eternity, into the portal of the burning legion, well. Deathwing thought with narrowed eyes, I cannot allow my child to be killed by demons now. He growled as with a newfound determination and madness. He roared and took flight, intending to find Naraku before the portal closes. Naraku wanted to puke as he accidentally tasted the waters of the Well of Eternity. The components were tainted, but he was able to isolate the demon influence in it and purged it via puking anyways as his body acquired the knowledge to recreate the Well of Eternity from the very beginning. Then the pain followed as he and his opponent crashed into the ground. Getting up, he noticed he was in a different place as he was surrounded by swarms of demons as Azishara was swift to recover, dirtied and bloody from their fight as she was infuriated by him tarnishing her. Then, a booming, sickening laugh filled with malice echoed throughout the air around them as Naraku found the source and shielded his eyes from the heat as Azishara merely basked in glory of the entity's presence. So, my dragon aspect comes to me chuckled the dark titan Sargeras as he looked down at Naraku's human form. The towering entity was something that Naraku knew he could not defeat. His kind at their peak of age and power can, but here, he was a mere whelp still growing. Sargeras, Naraku uttered in a hint of anxiety as Avenger stirred within. Titan, a primordial being that predates gods in certain lores of old. This is a fallen one. I would like to acquire the darkness in him to improve myself. Avenger spoke as Naraku eyed the Dark Titan and the Highborn Queen cautiously. He could still take her down, and a handful of demons before he is overwhelmed and overpowered if Sarger is stepped in, but it wouldn't hurt to have an ally right now right? Then a roar echoed from the portal, and came through it, in a form of molten lava and scorched black scales held together by armor of adamantine, Deathwing. Great, now I have to deal with him as... Naraku thoughts were cut off as Deathwing attacked the demonic army and leapt at Sargeras. Naraku, you must live, I will not allow my heir to be slain by these wretched creatures, bring forth a new generation of dragons. Deathwing bellowed as he scuffled with Sargeras. He wants me to live, Naraku thought as he thought for a minute, pieces of Neltharion lingered in him. Leave you pest, my dragon aspect is there, and I will have him. Sargeras bellowed as he delivered an uppercut to Deathwing as the sound of a broken jaw echoed out. Naraku knew he had to get out of here and turned to run only for Azishara and a group of demons to block the portal. Lord Sargeras wants you, and so shall he as a gift from me. She spoke as Naraku snarled as he began reverting to his dragon form. Deciding to make a reference to that one monster movie that Naruto had watched. His back grew dorsal fins that began to glow an ominous blue light from the tail up to the top as if charging up as he towered over them menacingly. Let's see you eat radiation bitch. Naraku roared as he unleashed a beam of radioactive energy at her and the demons. The impact it made with Azishara's barrier created an explosion unlike any other. The area a mile wide was engulfed in the searing heat of the explosion as Sargeras had tossed Deathwing out of the portal with a foul sneer as he adorned a scar down his right eye from the fallen dragon aspect before launching a fireball at Naraku's back, forcing the dragon down as demons quickly began to restrain him with chains. At long last, a dragon aspect of my own. Sargeras mused as he knelt down to examine Naraku. You will be the scourge to order, a bringer of ends, a devourer of worlds. 
You shall be the dragon aspect of death and chaos, he grinned maliciously as Naraku narrowed his eyes in defiance as he forced himself to resist the restraints upon him as Sarjeras laughed. Now rise, you whom shall now be a part of me, return all that stand in my way, to ruin. He spoke in a sphere of dark power, a piece of Sarjeras himself manifested as he infused Naraku with it as Naraku flailed in pain and agony as he roared in savage fury as his mind was being forcefully rewritten and body beginning to alter in appearance. Seeing his work done now with his new dragon aspect, he turned towards the portal to Azeroth and frowned. Something was holding his army back to the point that there were mountains of corpses of his minions piling up by the second. He had found a single green-skinned creature responsible for this, and with that puny axe, had the gall to stage an assault upon him and inflicting an injury. He was amused and angered by this foolish creature, as he met his end by his blade as he began to make way for Azeroth. He will end it there, but just as he was crossing the portals, it closed with him in it and vanished. His loyal higher ranked men were baffled by the sudden twist of events, that everyone in the burning legion frozen in shock at the apparent demise of their leader. But then, they heard. Naraku chuckled darkly. Well now, I did not expect my body to be destroyed like that, came the voice of Sarjeras out of. Naraku's mouth. I believe it was wise to infuse this dragon with a portion of myself as now I will have to make a few, adjustments to our plans. Kuljaden. The possessed Naraku called out as the red Eridar walked forth and knelt before him. What is it you seek my lord? He asked as, Naraku, smirked. I am going to need this dragon to become stronger, and leading an army of his own to destroy our enemies. He will be known as Tathamit, the will of Sargeras, my dragon aspect. Make sure he is cared for. Sargeras spoke as Kuljaden bowed his head. It will be done. Then, Naraku, turned to Azishara, who looked at the possessed dragon with devotion. You will be the one to accompany my new will, and make sure that his satisfactions are fulfilled, for you. Are his, broodmare. He finished, using the word broodmare from the encyclopedia within Naraku's mind. Apparently, Azishara had no idea what the word was and still agreed to his command. Oh he was going to be amused by this mortal's reaction later on. Hmm, I am overtaxed. This one is strong, which I need. I must rest and regain my strength. My body will reform, in time. Sarger is finished as, Naraku, regained his senses before growling menacingly. Where is my meal? I hunger for the souls of the weak. He bellowed, insanity and hatred in his eyes eyeing the nearest demons whom lost strength and fell to their knees from his glare as he broke free of his chains and devoured them. Bland, bland, where is a meal? Worth satisfying me, Tathamit. The wills called Jaden merely smiled at the newest edition of the Burning Legion. Soon, worlds will fall. Deathwing coughed as he dragged his body out of the ocean as steam hissed from it as he walked up Mount Hyjal. He had failed, his air captured by the Burning Legion and probably already transformed into a dragon aspect of Sargeras. His rage boiled as he continued upwards, uncaring for his injuries as he reached the peak, seeing numerous night elves fellow mortal creatures, dragons and even the dragon aspects themselves surprised by his appearance. They were all on edge at his presence, but he could care less for that. He had ominous news to give them. Isera, Naraku has been captured by the legion, Sargeras, turned into his aspect, he flinched as he held his jaw in pain. He was broken by the dark titan as he looked at his, sister-in-law, as the expression she bore was that of despair and anguish. Feeling his strength beginning to slip, he turned to retreat, only for Syntheria to land in front of him, and he noticed she looked different from what he could remember. You, she growled as Deathwing narrowed his eyes as he was surrounded by other aspects minus Isera. Consider it your victory Neltharion, Deathwing growled as he saw the spirit of the Earth Warder standing near Syntheria, but what price? Naraku is taken by the Legion, the world is asunder, and the true masters have other plans with or without the soul. The molten dragon continued. Either way, this world will fall by. Naraku's hands. I can feel it. Even I will fall at his rage. He spoke as Alexstrasza stepped forward. Neltharion, release our powers trapped within the dragon soul, or else. Or else what life binder? You'll kill me. Deathwing mocked as he held his jaw again from the pain. It really was broken. 
Damn he's going to have to get some sort of brace for that. Look at you all. Relying on the titan's precious gifts to fulfill your role. Naraku had done his best to try doing my job even without those so-called gifts, and I'm not exactly right in the head when it happened. He sneered as he noticed Neltharian's spirit eyeing him cautiously. Think of this as a lesson, what happens to us? Aspects when our duty is done, and all that power gone. He continued as the other aspects blinked and looked at each other. Will you still try your best to continue your duties, or will you just mope and sulk at the fact the powers that made us what we are, are all gone? He finished with a sneer as he seized that opportunity to take flight and flee as fast as he could. Deathwing can wait to reclaim his precious dragon soul, but the words of tainted wisdom will now seep into the other aspects. Creating doubt within them as it will echo in their minds. For now, he must build an army, for he had a feeling Naraku will be leading the legion onto this world one day. When that time comes, he'll be ready to reclaim his heir that and get a brace for his jaw, it was seriously starting to hurt Damid. Syntheria tried her best to soothe the aspects from doubt as her beloved Neltharian spirit helped her with her wordings, so she could act as his voice for him. Kraus and Ronan pondered about this new timeline they have unknowingly created as Illidan looked out to. The lake of Mount Hyjal with a frown upon his eyes as he looked at his hands. He was suffering from magic withdraw, he craves the power of the arcane but not as much as the highborn elves themselves. He'll find a way to subdue the hunger, but how will he save the other elves? With Naraku gone, whom can he go for advice? Neltharian, his father had fallen. Isera is in pain of her dearest now gone, and he could not go to Malfurion or Tarande in his current state of demonic influence. Who else can he talk to? You seem troubled brother, Malfurion's voice rang out, snapping Illidan out of his thoughts as he turned to See, his brother and Tarande before looking away ashamed. Magic was everything to me, the power it held, the secrets to unravel. Knowing it's gone now, what else could I do? What of the highborn elves, that will suffer from this withdrawal of arcane energies now that the well is gone? He asked as he pulled out a few vials with a frown. It was foolish to take some of these waters, knowing that these could draw the burning legion if another well of eternity was created from them. He admitted as Malfurion looked at his brother sadly. Controlling these urges will be simple, but their hunger is far worse brother. They will die without some sort of source of magical energy to channel from. Illidan continued, looking out to the sky. If Naraku were here, his wisdom would be very beneficial to us all. True, but we cannot forget him and his sacrifice. We must find a way to make sure the waters you've taken from the well of eternity. Do not fall into the wrong hands. Malfurion spoke softly. Then how about giving us one of the vials? A new voice asked as the three turned to see a highborn elf walk up to them. I am Daythramar, new leader of the highborn and I seek a way to save my people. He greeted them as Tarande recognized him. You, you're the one who betrayed Azishara and tried to slow their summoning of. Sargeras. Why do you seek to create a new well of eternity? She asked with a tranquil fury within her growing. I only seek to save my people from this dark hunger, but this time from our experience here. With the Legion, I do not want another war with them. I will create a well, smaller and more cautious, as numerous barriers and fail-safes to make sure the Burning Legion do not return. It is only enough to make sure our addiction to magic is sated, this priestess of Elun, I swear upon. He knelt and looked at her sincerely straight into her eyes, allowing her to see deep inside his soul and judge him. As she stared into his soul, she heard the whispers of the goddess Alun speak to her. Alun whispered of his innocence and sincere. Intense, of how the highborn that survived have learned harshly for reckless uses of arcane magic, and how it will serve as a constant reminder of their humility. With that, the surviving highborn were given a vial, and they had proceeded to leave the place in self-exile to find a new home where they can practice their arcane abilities in safety and with caution. That was when Illidan handed over a vial of the well's waters to Nazdormu before disappearing from Night Elf Society and into the unknown. His history began to flow properly as the world tree. Nordrasil was created as the waters created from a smaller well of eternity was used as the remaining dragon aspects began blessing the elves and the tree. As they watched, Ronan and Kraus looked at each other with worry in this new timeline. Rox had died stalling time and even attacking Sargeras himself and Naraku, 
The dragon that Nazdormu claimed to be an important change in the future is now enslaved by the dark. Titan. They can feel it. History was changing as their memories were blooming and dying in numerous instances to accommodate to this altered history. From Krauss's own view from his new memories and what had been unleashed with dawning horror, they had created a fatal paradox. Isera guarded her clutch with much fever, not letting anyone near it, not even her beloved sister Alex Straza herself to inspect the eggs. She protected these eggs with extreme prejudice as she nuzzled them dearly. They were so close to hatching, they were her only remaining bond with her mate Naraku as she can no longer feel him within the Emerald Dream. Her own flight had been busy patrolling the Emerald Dream as they felt something dark disturbing the sacred place. She rested her head, trying to let sleep embrace her exhausted mind as she wished for Naraku's warmth at her side. With her still closed eyes, she can feel a malicious laugh echoing within it. The sun was rising the jade-colored eggs began shaking, waking the sleeping aspect from her restless slumber. The eggs cracked, as tooth horns pierced the shells as small dragon whelplings emerged through. She marveled at the sight of them, as her sick shade of emeralds, these scales of her new clutch were as smooth as jade. They screeched as they imprinted on her as she nuzzled the newly hatched clutch lovingly. Members of both hers and Naraku's flight watched from afar, a sense of peace over watching them as they vowed to watch over this new family together. Time is a cruel and unforgiving force. It marches on without pause, even with ripples. Yet like a river's stream may its tides change. The hatchlings grew slowly over time, learning and mastering their new gift that brought awe to the remaining four flights still overlooking the balance of the world. As they grew into their prime age as dragons, they traveled east to a different land. They passed the maelstrom that their father Naraku had vanished in, further eastwards to where the black dragonfly dwell, and of a species not of Torin, Centaur, Quillbore, Wyvern, nor Night Elf. They encountered the very first time. A species of mortal that were pink skins, or as they were preferred to be called, humans. All right, men, these dragons hold a very unique form of magic we must learn of. So remember, capture them alive. A mage told the mercenaries who nodded their heads as they prepared their gear to go dragon hunting. They looked to the forest ahead as they were aware of the forest in front of them wasn't supposed to even be there. It just grew overnight with rich fruit that tasted like it was a gift from the gods, and the fact that these dragons had traveled here are responsible for it made many to want more. Brother, are you sure it was wise to grow such a forest here? One of the dragons inquired as the supposed leader. The firstborn son who called himself Kurokazi looked at the one of the younger siblings. Trust me Camellia, we must regain nutrients from our long travel here. The bones spoke to us and guide us here to this unknown land for father. Kurokazi replied evenly as. Camellia lowered her head. From the aid of Malagos, as a gift he one of his own flight's bones were turned into special totems that work as dice. Attuned of magic and nature, it had high accuracy and foretold the return of their father. Naraku the Shadow Wing, the legendary black WYRM of the black dragonflight that rivaled Neltharion the Earth Warder in might whom in return was his sire and their grandfather. Their father's and mother's flight sang songs of his might against the demonic army of the Burning Legion and how he battled the Mad Queen Azishara as they fell into the portal where the Legion were erupting from in a battle of proportions when the portal collapsed. They knew their sire was alive, their blood was resonating with that of his own, which was far away from them, yet so close at the same time. He was foretold to return in the Far East where none but dragons dared travel to rage war against his own will by dark forces. The Jade Dragonflight they called themselves, for their skin was that of Jade. They have no scales, but their skin-like surface was as hard as that of the Hell Dragon's adamantine form, their head adorning. Horns long and elegant like branches of a tree as their slender bodies allowed aerial grace in the skies while maintaining a mainly vegetarian diet with a few times of good meat in between seasons. They were blessed with a gift over nature, blessing it so that forests can erupt from nowhere, turning empty lands into lush rainforests, deserts into oases, and allowing rich harvests in spring. As they feasted on the ripe fruit, Kurokazi froze in mid-bite as he heard a twig snap. Standing upright like his sire's flight did, he scanned the forest and sniffed the air. He smelled arcane energies and spilt dragon blood, the kind that made his lips curl into a snarl. Dragon hunters, 
He hissed quietly enough not to alert said hunters and alert his kin. They were alert now, and with cunning. Worthy of their father and of his father, pretended they heard nothing as they feasted upon the rich fruit. They bid their time, as they slowly drew upon their magic as the hunters slowly crept closer to becoming the hunted. As soon as the second twig snapped, the forest erupted into a murderous forest of thorn, and screams echoed through it as barbs and spears impaled flesh. Naraku had wondered how long has it been since he's been out. He had some freedom with the help of Avenger as they got involved with beings known as the Zelnaga and their uplifted species the Protoss and Zerg and space-traveling humans known as Terrans. Oh sure, the few hundred years of freedom and getting involved in one of the most epic of wars of all time was something worth remembering and replaying. Too bad he had no control again. But hey, he really did have fun beating Jim's record at that minigame in the bar. Hope he and Kerrigan can live their lives peacefully now. As he was shaken from his thoughts, he frowned at the new world his possessed body was currently making home to, Drainer. From what he could gather, the life forms there were primitive and a species known as Drainy were the ones that certain members of the Burning Legion hated with a passion. He could see why, the follow the light, which reminded him faintly of religion with the compassion and the niceties involved in it. After seeing many wars, he grew sick of such beliefs. There is always a dark side to sentient beings with religions, as hypocrisy always exists one way or another. Tathamit was enjoying the use of his body, but Naraku was cunning. He limited what the death aspect could wield with his powers and relish in the monster's frustrations of the host limiting his potential. He couldn't use his host's newer powers either and the aspect sought them to make the legion even stronger. He sat on his throne in human form, Naraku's human form that had the green glow of fell magic in his eyes as Azishara sat on his lap, grinding her rear against him as he smirked. He had broken the once proud elf queen, her mind was delusional already when he was born, and after honeyed words and a little of his demonic powers bends her thoughts and will to his own. His own little slut so to say, to be used over and over again till he grew bored of her. Tathamit seethed at such a ridiculous nickname and wondered if. Naraku had ever met such dragons before. The mere sound of those mere nicknames concludes that those two were hopeless perverts from some sort of fictional story that perverts would enjoy reading. He was living the dream, not reading about it. Speaking of which, he had a lovely elf queen to screw. Naraku yawned as he began to dose off in his mind. Tathamit once again screwing Azishara like no tomorrow as his body began to feel the same pleasure Tathamit felt. It was a weird experience and he pondered how Avenger is doing since Tathamit took over. It forcibly subdued all the world's evil in a clash of wills as the dark entity was in a cationic state after the Zelnaga crisis, it actually worried. Naraku of the thing he hated and was strangely getting fond of. Void of vengeance hidden fragments Turinox, the nobody of Cypher Naruto sat in his chair in his lab as his five daughters held their respective keyblades and inspecting a strange addition their father made to them, the gazing eyes. One of them asked, that's not what they're called. Turinox answered as another looked at the eye on her weapon. Then what is it called? She asked as Turinox pondered for a bit with a shrug. It has no name, but I can say they are real eyes, my eyes to be exact, he told them. Ew! The five exclaimed as they recoiled in shock as they held their keyblades a bit further from themselves. Oh, you think, that's gross? De ya, he demanded, pretending to act like he was grossed out to express what they're thinking. Oh, and no papa. Spoke on of his daughters. Right. He dryly retorted without a care. So anyways about your missions. He began pointing at four of them. You four are assigned to observe each incarnation of me across time and space and use those eyes on your keyblades to record them. Tenryu, Naraku, my own soul, and myself in the future when I'm reborn after some time WHLAY me and I'm divided again. Our youngest and dearest of the family will use her powers over time and space to send you to your locations and pick you up when the time comes for another gathering. We're supposed to go by ourselves? What about the others? Another asked as Turinox chuckled. Those are minor details. Your missions are important to make sure that I am rid of the corruption that will make the future my completed self will fulfill. I'm sure we want to rid of that horrible outcome Cypher Hinata saw didn't we? He asked as his daughters nodded their heads in agreement. I understand the situation father, 
but across time and space and observe every event with those eyes, will we even be safe? Another of the four chosen asked. All you have to do is have the I, on your keyblade see any incarnation of Cypher Naruto and it records everything in between the times you've last recorded them. Kind of an, self-updating blog that has lots of contents each time you have the, I, record them from the last time. He explained as he stood up. I'm willing to bet that each incarnation of Cypher Naruto, myself included, found hints of what could save us from turning into that thing, and were forgotten. Even with great age and power we will tend to forget such important things. Those eyes will help make sure even the tiniest of details won't escape. And if the other incarnations are in state in a state of dormancy, the eyes will close, signaling that you can go off and do your thing until they awaken again. After all, you're biologically immortal now thanks to the knowledge Ananko's gave me so you've got time to kill enjoying your eternal youth. As long as you like, he gestured as his daughters looked at him as he sighed. I must warn you, you will see, me, doing good and bad things throughout my lifetimes. You can judge me if I'm a good or terrible person as a father from your own observations. Judge me accordingly, but all I ask for is that you find some sort of happiness in your life that you can cherish for eternity. He requested as the four of them nodded their heads in silent agreement as there was a sense of sadness in their hearts. They were going to see the best and worst sides of him in their mission but pray that there was some semblance of the father they had come to love in all of them. With that, the fifth daughter, an astrograph sorceress began to harness her power to bend time and space to her will and began sending the four chosen to their respective targets at the start of their beginnings. Come Stella, there is a secret task I have for you. Turinox called out as Stella Uzumaki, the fifth daughter of Turinox followed her father to a hidden chamber that she didn't know until now existed. Your mission is important, as you know I will be divided again in the future afterwards in a great battle. My mind will be lost and lead to the downfall of mankind in the future. You are to find and follow it, and make sure it's sent somewhere safe that only you know. Someplace even I won't know as a whole, he explained as he patted a lone chest in the center of the chamber. You are to also make sure to keep this chest safe there as well, he added as Stella looked at it. What's in it daddy? The girl asked as Turinox looked at her with a sly smile, it's a secret. And the best part is, he snickered as he stood up straight. Until the time comes, you can never, ever, open it. He told her with a mildly serious tone, great, now I really want to know. Stella told him, excitement in her voice as he chuckled. Oh alright then, I'll indulge you. He smiled as he looked at her. But this secret stays between the two of us and until the chest itself activates, you must never open it. He warned her. I promise. She swore as he grinned. He gestured her to lend her his ear and he began whispering it to her. Her expression changing with what she was learning as she turned to him with shock. But why? She exclaimed. You'll see, he grinned dangerously as he clenched his fist dramatically. Void of vengeance hidden fragments end. I must say Cold Jaden, manipulating these paltry clans to unite is quite a feat. Tathamet mused as he watched Gul'dan manipulate the clans with the demonic powers he gained as the greed in his glowing red eyes shone visibly to those aware of his nature. Yes my liege. We will have our newest army of savage orcs slaughter the cowards who turned away from Lord Sargeras's gifts. The corrupted demon replied as Tathamet grinned as he eyed the city the Draenei have built on this primitive world. He had developed a rather interesting hunger for light, and will be the bane of those who dared deny the gifts his maker. I will lead this assault, and take what is rightfully mine, he declared as Kuljadin merely bowed his head. He knew the dragon aspect takes what he wants, and keeps it, and no one, not even himself must not draw the ire of Sargeras's will. Bring me a pit lord, one that has failed us too many times. Tathamet ordered as he heard Naraku whisper of a gift he could enjoy, he wasn't sure why, but Naraku found the pit lord's blood to be quite useful in some way the aspect could not understand. As the unfortunate pit lord was summoned, Tathamet was in dragon form as it glared down at the worthless wretch that disappointed the legion for far too long. Consume it, gain the pit lord's power of the blood pact and your own personal army shall await. Naraku whispered as he felt a surge of power in his host's body and a deep gnawing hunger as the death aspect grinned. The pit lord screamed for mercy and in fear, 
the desperation to live as it felt its soul being consumed. Kuljadin watched warily, seeing the dragon's body expand and growing a crest on its head as fell magic in the form of flames made it look like a demonic crown as the dragon laughed darkly. The pit lord's power with its blood is now mine. I cannot wait for the tests I can do on our prey. A cold chill swept the spines of many life forms, an instinct of fear slowly seeping into them as they all cautiously looked around to find the source. For the drainy, it was an ill omen that spelt there. Inevitable doom. As the sun settled, the orcs rallied into what was known as the Horde, their once brown skin turned green from fell corruption. At the same time, a rift in space and time opened up as one of the daughters of Turinox walked in, her keyblade in hand as the red eye on her weapon glowed. So, this is where Naraku is? She asked herself quietly, observing the land before her as she covered her head with her hood. Time to observe, although I won't like where this will be going since father warned me of Naraku's corruption. This will be a long mission, she sighed in resignation. Tathamit sneered at the orcs and their horde. The invasion on the Draini was imminent and he hungered for their light. The citadel that Gul'dan and his shadow council raised was perfect for his throne as he observed the group craft something with their dark magic. It had power, a dark power to it, infused with the pinnacle of shadow magic as Gul'dan kept it close to him. The shadow orb it was called, and even he could sense the distortion effect it had on the one who wielded it. The foolish warlock's hunger for power will be his downfall and he'll be there to collect the remains and find use of it later. But it seems that even these wretched pests knew the importance of alliances, for now ogres were joining their cause. The raids on temples and villages of the traitorous Draini have been boorish but a bit filling. He got to feast on the souls of the priests, consuming the light they so revere as offering from orcs to him were invigorating. He even found himself a lovely little Draini to keep as a pet, one named Ural. He had her do the simplest of things, refill his chalice, offer him food when required, and to be by his side. He smelt her fear. Hear her heart beating rapidly at even the smallest hint of his anger. He has almost broken her spirit when he devoured the priests of the now black temple's light and th most his to serve eternally. Naraku whispered to him to wait till the capital fell, then make her drink their blood so the bond is absolute. The death aspect had now knowledge of what magic was in their blood and was anticipating the promising results. But now the finale awaited them. Gul'dan was preparing the blood pact with Manorot. Soon the orcs will bow to the legion. This world will be theirs to command as fell magic burns the sky. Valen sipped his cup in silence as he gazed upon the cloudy night sky, the stars hidden as thunder rumbled. It was an ill omen in his. Visions of orcs, ogres, and a menacing dragon ravaging the capital. The dragon devouring their light, pillaging their temples, feasting upon the souls of the slain as all worshipped its cruelty. He sensed a portion of Sargeras within it, and the prisoner of its own body dormant. The dark titan will without a doubt be watching from the dragon's eyes as the draini will be hunted down one by one. Then the shockwave erupted. A path of devastation on Telmar's many buildings as a great black dragon with savage blue tattoos on its scales and a mane of fell magic bellowed the end of days as the skies rained infernals as orcs with red eyes of bloodlust swarmed. Screams of terror, pain, and despair engulfed the city as it was now being washed up in a sea of fire as the dragon burned all in its way. It cared not if it was drainy, orc, demon. Everything was a target in its path of death and ruin. Tathamit rejoiced in the destruction as he felt all the world's evil his host body had been infused since birth grow stronger with more chaos he sowed. It was invigorating as he drank in the souls of the slain. He felt his power swell even more as his body started to grow. He gritted his teeth, the growth spurts harming him with every second as his irritation turned to rage. He continued to destroy and wreak havoc onto the city as he killed any living being in his path and those who watched marveled at the will of Sargeras and his might. He felt the drainy prisoner of his from afar, her despair and anguish. Likened to the salting of meat as he chuckled darkly. The grand finale of his days roaming afar to becoming a god are now at hand. Sargeras was proud of his achievements as he was preparing for the next. World to be burned by the legion. He reverted to his mortal form as he walked past the orcs who bowed to him as he turned his gaze towards Gul'dan. Prepare the horde for the future, 
a new world unspoiled and rich with foods and water and victims to be put to the axe await. He ordered as he infused Gul'dan with a vision of their next world of conquest, Azeroth. Black Citadel, Tathamit walked through the recently cleared hallways as he took a pitcher and chalice of his own design with him. He shed several drops of blood into the pitcher as the water turned into the color of red wine as his twisted powers were concealed in it. He walked towards the throne of his making, made of bones drainy and stones of finest quality as a mockery toward what the temple once stood for as he saw Ural at the corner, tears in her eyes as Tathamit calmly walked towards her. Today is a time for the horde to celebrate. He spoke, tone calm and eyes calculating. He poured the wine into his chalice as he looked down at her. Today I am in a rather generous mood, one that you should consider yourself lucky with sharing at this moment. He continued as he pretended to sip the wine. I could at least spare you at least a cup of wine for good behavior, he finished as he handed her the chalice. Ural could have knocked it out of his hands, cursed him, and wasted a worthless drink to mourn for her slain kin. But she couldn't, she lost everything and she knew that the smallest slight against this monster would bring her a fate worse than death and the light will not help her. She bowed her head, dispirited as she accepted the chalice and slowly began drinking the contents. She drank it down to the last drop as her body felt numb as she fell to her knees. Panting as glowing tattoos were appearing over her skin as Tathamit laughed. You are now mine girl, my devoted concubine. He sneered, his eyes with delight as Ural realized what was happening to her as he sat on his throne, watching her. She felt her mind changing what it shouldn't be, her thoughts altering, and her devotion focused on something else. Visions of her pleasing him, her womb swelling with his seed, birthing his children and giving him everything he desired of her, for she was his, and she aimed to please her lord and master. Slowly rising, she started to take off her clothing as she was in her small clothes and walked towards him swaying her hips as she straddled him and caressed his cheeks. Master, she spoke, her voice sultry and alluring. How may I please you? She inquired as she grinded against him as. Tathamit smirked, pulling her face towards his and claim her lips with his own. The peons of the horde began construction of the camp, farms to keep their cattle and utilizing the fertile soil of the land to grow food while Tathamit meditated, communing with his vessel, prisoner, for a deal. You seek knowledge of this world? I hate to disappoint you, but I've not stepped into this world for nearly 10,000 years. To see that humans are starting to populate this part of the world has stirred Avenger from his comatose form. It was true. The source of all evils in the world was resonating with the natives of this world. The curse was originally designated to target humans, but now any sapient being was a viable target. It just happens to like targeting humans the most even when Tathamit has subdued the dark entity within his host. You have fought in several great wars, as a strategist. Perhaps you could share some good advice? The death aspect inquired with a hidden threat that Naraku knew of. Seek out this kingdom's allies, study them, and crush them. I recommend decimating the naval fleet belonging to a different kingdom that I sense far away. Let the horde handle this petty kingdom. Cool Tiras is the one you seek although the mages of a certain place on. Azeroth will be quite a nuisance if left alone if what our dear demons spoke of were true. I commend your ability to speak with planets Naraku, Tathamit praised, inwardly jealous of Naraku's natural gifts he would rarely share with. Perhaps you know of some dark magic ritual of sorts to give these wretched orcs power against these mages? He asked. There is one, a dark ritual that is forbidden that I learned from the Millennium Spellbook. A book from another reality that was in a locked sector of the cipher's forbidden libraries. Now this brought the death aspect's attention. He felt knowledge pour into his mind and he grinned at the forbidden secrets and parts of several additions to the ritual Naraku inscribed from his own knowledge. He noticed Gul'dan was walking up to him and he spoke his demands. Bring me as much gold as you can, and 99 human sacrifices. The horde will be given a gift by me to aid in their endeavors. He spoke as Gul'dan bowed his head. The greed in his red eyes shone as he began his work. Naraku pondered if it was the right thing to do, but decided it was best to cooperate now and earn the corruption's trust, then when the time was right, expel this blight for good. But Sargeras was watching from the inside as well, his portion was something to be very cautious of. By nightfall seven days later, 99 humans were brought before him from the horde's raid on human settlements, men. 
Women and children alike were here and the mass of gold collected from both Drainer and the humans in a giant cauldron of steel. With his fire, the gold melted into a lake of gold as the humans were thrown in. The warlock chanted the dark aria as the ground shook. While shadows danced, it made Goldan smile with excitement of more power as he felt the power from within the cauldron overwhelm the lesser orcs as chieftains roared savagely with pride as the wind tore around them. Tathamit pierced the ground, creating a small hole violed infused with the blood, flesh and souls as it was poured into the ground as the chants grew more powerful as Tathamit imbued an additional chant to the spell. The gold sank into the earth as it shook. A giant monument erupted from the earth, a great sarcophagus as seven golden items were embedded into it. Tathamit walked towards it, and pulled out the staff from its slot. Goldan, approach. He commanded. The greatest warlock of the horde approach, bowing as the will of Sargeras presented the staff. To him. Take the staff of hunger, with it. May your enemy's powers weaken as your own grows. He spoke as Goldan humbly took it and felt the power of the item course through him. Gromash. Hellscream, chieftain of the Warsong clan, he called out as the legendary orc walked to him in stride. Your might is legendary, your fury untamed. Tathamit spoke as he pried out the axe, take the edge of wrath, and with your rage growing with every second, so will the edge's own power. Grom took the axe with a snarl as he roared in primal anger as the weapon resonated and glowed an ominous blood-red color. Kilrog Deadeye, come forth. Tathamit ordered as the chieftain of the Bleeding Hollow clan walked forward. You see things no mortal can see through your ancestors' great rituals. The death aspect told him as he pried the golden eye from its socket. So with the eye of truth, shall you see things clearer than anyone else. The orb glowed as Tathamit shoved it into Kilrog's empty eye socket, the power coursing through the orc as he roared in agony as his body was adapting to the new power. Duratan of the Frostwolf, approach. The silence was intense as the chieftain of the Frostwolf clan approach. Caution in his step as he was one of the few whom did not drink the pit lord's blood, ensuring his services to the legion. You seek to uncover the truth of things, yet you walk in a dark forest blinded by worry and fear. The dragon aspect drawled out as he pried another item. With the compass of stars, may you and your people be guided towards the right path before you. The compass was a necklace with strange prongs alongside the edges as the center of it was a multi-pointed star that had a faint glow to it. Duratan accepted the gift, placing it on his neck as he felt nothing from it. Orgrim of the Blackrock clan, come forward. Now the other of the clan whom did not drink the demon blood approached. A wary expression on his face as Tathamit grinned. Your clan is divided, but still function as a whole. Depending on the choice you make in your lifetime young chieftain, they will emerge glorious, or met a terrible ruin ahead. This made Orgrim Doomhammer grit his teeth, as if something he was told was coming to pass. For that, I grant you this. Prying another relic, he presented it to Orgrim. This is. The Seal of Fellblood, a relic specifically used to punish foolish warlocks whom dare misuse their powers against the Horde's noble cause. Orgrim took the seal and looked at it. It was a medallion with ancient writing of an unknown origin that filled him with a strange sense of peace. Now saving one of the best for last, Blackhand, come forth. The orcs let out cries of joy and salutes, cheers as the leader of the Horde walked forward and bowed to Tathamit. You are the one who lead the assault against the secretive Draenei on Draenor, eliminating them and their self-righteous oppression with their light, become the bane to those that harness that wretched light, with this. Tathamit bellowed as he pried the sixth item from the sarcophagus. I give to you, gnawing shadow. He presented a gauntlet to the warchief, it was small, but when it landed in Blackhand's palm, it grew to the size of his hand as he wore it as a complete fit. It shall devour the light of your enemies, render them weak and to teach them the meaning of despair, he sneered as. Blackhand lifted his armored fist in the air as all other orcs did the same in salute. Yes, with this this kingdom in the south shall fall, I shall heed. Naraku's advice and destroy the naval fleet of cool tiras, no better yet, conquer and make it my domain. Tathamit mentally laughed as he held the seventh item in his hand. It was a ring, inscripted with a dark language that glowed with the light of fire as he wore it. 
the master ring which controls all other artifacts so they won't be used against him, and offer him tithes from their own growing power as the more they were used. So you're going to attempt to take over an entire island kingdom by yourself? Naraku inquired after the ceremony was complete as Tathamit laughed in his personal chambers. Of course not my foolish vessel. Tathamit replied with a cruel smirk as he got onto his bed. My dear Ural and Azishara are going to assist me in this glorious conquest. Right girls? He asked as said girls crawled onto the bed trailing their hands over his body as they smiled at him. Of course our liege. We will assist you with anything you want. They purred as Tathamit wrapped an arm around their waists and pulled them close. It was going to be a glorious conquest indeed. Deathwing growled at the entrustion to his lair, forest vines restraining his brood as he himself barged into the entryway of his cave to bear witness to those foolish enough to enter his domain, the Fallen. Aspect blinked at the sight of Naraku's spawn, all calm and bearing a seriousness in their eyes as the leader of the flight bowed to him. Grandfather, it has been a long time since we've seen you. The dragon spoke with fondness as Deathwing quelled his anger at the sight of his legacy. Kurokazi, what is the meaning of this sudden intrusion? Deathwing inquired as the dragon looked at him. Father has returned to this world, under the control of the legion and with these, creatures called the orcs at his command, he answered. Deathwing snarled at the information, his seething lava blood flowing angrily at the news. Sargeras had taken his protological son and twisted him to his will. He came prepared though, he recreated his dragon soul on a weaker scale for this exact purpose. The device was to absorb the will of Sargeras's power and restore Naraku's mind from the corruption. He would free his son, and he was willing to do whatever it took to save him. The End Remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next video.